Your Honor, we call Mr. John C. Depp. All right. If you could stand, sir. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Mr. Depp. Good afternoon. Can you please tell the jury why you're here today? Um, yes. Um, about six years ago, um, uh, Ms. Hurd made uh, some quite heinous and, um, uh, disturbing, uh, brought these disturbing criminal um, acts um, against uh, me that uh, that were not based in any species of truth. Um, it was a, it was a complete shock uh, that it would. It just didn't need to go in that direction, um, as nothing, nothing of the kind had ever happened, though it, it, the relationship, um, there were um, arguments and um, things of that nature. But never did I myself reach the point of um, uh, striking Miss Heard in any way, nor have I ever struck uh, um, any woman um, in my life. And so I, <clears throat> at the time, because the news of this her accusations had uh, sort of permeated the industry and then made its way through media and social media became quite a global um, uh, let's say quote unquote fact if you will and since I knew that there was no truth to it whatsoever, I felt it my responsibility to uh, to stand up not only for myself um, in that instance, but stand up for my children, who at the time were uh, f 14 and 16. And so they were in high school and uh, I, I thought it was diabolical that my children would have to go to um, school and have their friends or people in the school approach them with the infamous People magazine cover with uh, uh, Miss Heard with a, a dark bruise on her face. Um, and then it just kept um, the it kept multiplying. It, it, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. So it was my responsibility, I felt, to not only attempt to clear my name um, for the sake of well, for many reasons, but I wanted to clear. Uh, my children of of this horrid thing that they were having to read about their father that was which was untrue, and also after many years of being in this um, industry um, I, at the time it was probably i 'd probably been in the industry thirty plus years thirty five years um, 
never had had any problems, anything like that. And I had met many people over, over the years, many, many of the people, and had had the opportunity to talk to those people and to um, g even give advice to these people. And I'm, I'm not, um, my goal is the truth. My goal is the truth because it, it, it killed me that people that I had spoken with, that I had met with over the years, who I, who maybe were in a, not such a great position and they needed advice, and I gave them the best advice I could, um, all I could think of was that those people would 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 think that I um, was a fraud and that I had lied to them, and so I had to wait for my opportunity to um, address the charges, which were criminal charges, um, and 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 they, and they just weren't uh, true. So I, I felt the responsibility of clearing the record as um, the only the only way that i could get that i could get to the point where i could speak um has really taken this full 6 years and it's been 6 years of trying times it's very strange when one day you're uh, Cinderella, so to speak, and then in 0 0.6 seconds you're Quasimodo. And um, I, 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 I didn't uh, deserve that, nor did my children, nor did the people who have believed in me for all these years. I, I didn't want anybody, any of those people to believe that I had done them wrong or lied to them or that I was a fraud. I, I, I'm, I pride myself on honesty. I pride myself on truth. Truth is the only thing I'm interested in. Other lies will get you nowhere, but, um, Lies build upon lies and build upon lies. It's too much to cover. I, I, I'm obsessed with the truth. And, um, so today is my, actually my, the first uh, opportunity that I've been able to speak about this, um, case, uh, in full for the, for the first time. Mr. Depp, how do you feel about the intimate details of your life being aired in this process? Um, as a father, um, raising kids, you know, when they were very, very little, um, it was important to me, very important to me, to, to try to shield my children as much as possible from um, looking at their father uh, or, their, or their mom, for that matter, uh, as uh, uh, novelties. I, I didn't want my children to experience um, hordes of paparazzis. Um, so I was always a very private person. Um, so for me to come up here and stand before you or sit before you all um, and spill the truth um, is quite exposing. And um, it's unfortunate that, that it's not only exposing 
for myself, it's exposing for my family, it's exposing for Miss Heard, it's exposing for... It's, um... It, it never had to go in this direction. And so I... I can't say that I'm embarrassed because I know that I'm doing the right thing. <clears throat> Now, Mr. Depp, um, I'd like to turn a bit to your upbringing. Um, we heard a bit from your sister, Christy, last week. But can you please tell the jury in your own words about your, your childhood upbringing? Um, I had a very interesting childhood, um, one that I thought was normal until a certain age. My mother, um, I was born in Kentucky. And um, then we moved, in which we moved around quite a lot um, when I was a kid. So you were always just, my mom had this, uh, her feet were on fire and she had to move, you know. So we moved constantly. So you were always the new kid. And that wasn't ever particularly pleasant. Then we moved to Florida. South Florida when I was about seven or eight. Um, and again, moved several, several times. But um, my mother was quite unpredictable. She was very unpredictable. Um, she was a... She had the ability to be as as cruel as anyone can be um, with all of us. Uh, that is to say, my sister Christy and my my brother Danny and my sister Debbie, and um, also my father. <clears throat> so. Um, essentially. Um, she was, uh, she could become quite violent, and she was quite violent, and she was quite cruel, and she, and though there was physical abuse, certainly, um, which could uh, be in the form of uh, an ashtray being flung at you, you know, it, hit you in the head or you'd get beat with a high heel shoe or, or a telephone or whatever is handy. Um, so in our house, there was no, we were never exposed to any type of safety um, or security. The, the, um, the only thing that one could do, really, um, was to try to stay out of the line of fire. You, um, I started to um, be able to observe and I could see, I could start to see when she was about to head, head into a uh, head into a, a situation where she was going to get riled up and somebody was going to get it. Um, generally, uh, it was me. Mr. Depp, you mentioned that your mother could be cruel. How could she be cruel? Um, the, well, the various categories, I suppose, are... There are, there's, there's physical violence, of course, there's physical abuse, um, to which she was, um, that was a constant. That was just a constant, you know. We were all somewhat shell-shocked, you know, even if she just walked past us, you'd, you'd, <laughs> you'd sort of shield yourself because you didn't know what was going to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um... So there was there was the physical abuse, which was was uh, a constant. Um, there was uh, quite.
quite a lot of verbal abuse. There was quite a lot of name calling and um, bullying. You know, m making fun of making fun of whatever defect you know w w one might have. You know, if my brother wore glasses, so of course he was four eyes, or <laughs> and he had his teeth were messed up in the front, so he was buck tooth as well. Um, um, my sister Christy, which this is such a a hideous psychological play. Uh, my 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 father's uh, parents were quite refined. My mother comes from Eastern Kentucky, which is is uh, where you grow up in shacks and hol and hollers, you, you know, and. Uh, My, my my mother despised uh, m my father's parents, and my grandmother's name was Violet. And every now and again, you would hear my mother just scream across the house, "Come here, Violet! Get in here, Violet!" And Christy, my sister, knew very well that that was uh, a deep a deep cut psychologically, emotionally, but we had to take it. I mean, you, you just had to take the pain. Um, I, I was born with a very strange, it was a very rare uh, thing in my eye as the, the, the back of the lens is spherical. Uh, normally um, is spherical, so in this eye it isn't normal. This eye I was born um, with a more conical uh, lens, so uh, my brain never learned to see out of my left eye, and they noticed when I was about uh, three, four, five, three, four, that I had a, a lazy eye, a wandering eye, and um, um, she would call me, she would call me cockeye, one eye, um, any, anything, anything she could get to, to, uh, uh, demean, humiliate. Um, uh, I even had to wear, um, I had to wear an eye patch on my good eye, uh, to strengthen my, my bad eye so that it, would cease to wander with a muscle. It was exercising the muscles of the eye, though the brain had never learned to see. So I still, uh, my vision in my left eye is, uh, I'm legally blind in my left eye. But um, so yeah, the 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 verbal abuse, the psychological abuse, was. Uh, was almost worse than the than the than the than the, the beatings because the beatings were just physical pain and the physical pain you learn to deal with you learn to accept it you learn to deal with it um, but the, uh, the psychological and emotional abuse that's what uh, that's what kind of tore us up I think what about your father? What was he like? My father, my father was a very kind man. Uh, in fact, my father's still alive. He's he's a very kind man. Um, he's, he's a very quiet man. Um, in fact, he's very shy. Um, not a confrontational uh, person in any way. And when Betty Sue, my mother, um, would go off on 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 a tangent uh, toward my my father, um, and 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 of course in front of the kids, it was no matter to her. Uh, he would he would um, 
he, he amazingly remained very, very stoic and uh, never, as she was rationing him with horrible um, things, he stood there and just looked at her while she delivered the pain and he swallowed it, he took it. Um, there was never one moment, never a moment when my father um, lost control and attacked my mother or hit my mother or even said, even said a bad thing to my mother. What, what I, the things that I witnessed were, there were a couple of times when it got too far that I, I would see his, I could see his eyes welling up as he was staring at her, saying nothing. Um, and then the most that he would do is he would, he would, he would punch a, a, a wall. I, I once saw him punch a wall and um, it was shatter his hand because it wasn't, it wasn't drywall, it was um, proper concrete and steel wire and rebar and things of that nature and uh, um, but still never never touched her never um, argued with her he, uh, he 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 remained a gentleman and to me as a five-year-old boy I kept thinking to myself I kept wondering why why does he take it how does he how does he take this and 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 why doesn't he leave her um, but he didn't you know um, he was able to maintain his calm and his composure he was able to maintain uh, his relationship with his children um he was uh, he was he was a good man. He is a good man. You mentioned that you saw your father punch a wall. How many times did you witness that? I mean, out of out of I couldn't count the amount of fights that they had, but I I, I know that I I've, I've seen my father strike uh, a wall. Um, two or three times tops once <clears throat> when he broke his hand um, but yeah two, two two three times at tops you know was your father ever abusive to you or any of your siblings uh, no my father was never my father was not an abusive man um, at the same time, my father was also, um, to some degree, at the mercy of Betty Sue, uh, because if he argued with what she wanted done, that would just turn into uh, a another um, barrage of, of, of hatred uh, towards him. So I can remember my father coming home from work and maybe I'd, I'd, I'd gotten a bad report card or maybe I'd uh, gotten in trouble at school or um, something like that. And my father would arrive home from work and the first thing she would say was, John, take, take him out there. He gets the belt, give him the belt. And he wanted to know what it was about, so he'd take me out to the garage, and uh, I'll never forget the uh, this white, thick leather 1970s era, thick leather white belt that he would um, take off, and and um, and then he would uh, commence to uh, 
inflict the punishment uh, on on me. Um, but interestingly, there was a, there was one time when my father. I I kept telling him I I didn't do this. It was another incident. I kept swearing to him that I I did not do what Betty Sue, my, what my mom had said that I'd done. But he went through with the punishment anyway. <clears throat> and then, uh, not long after, he found out that I had been telling the truth and that I hadn't done what uh, I, what my mom had said that I'd done um, and he he came to me and uh, apologized to me for um, for having gone through with the whipping you know with the belt and um, I have to say um, my mom never did that she couldn't she, she knew what she knew she was raised how she was raised, and um, I had no power to change what was inside of her, you know. How did your parents' relationship ultimately come to an end, to your understanding? Um, when my father left, I, I didn't realize that he had left. He left to her. I, I was 15. I had, I had already uh, left school. And I was a musician. I was playing in clubs and such. And uh, he left for work one morning, just like every day, and was packing his car. And then he left. And then hours later, uh, my mom, Betty Sue, came home from work. It was about 3.30 in the afternoon. And she walked in the door and stopped. And, and just looked around like she felt something. And she just, I said, what's wrong? She said, your daddy's gone. I said, well, yeah, I seen him leave for work this morning. She said, no, 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 he's gone, he's gone. And she ran into the, uh, into their bedroom and into their closet. And I followed her and I, she opened the door and there was one, yeah, his side, his rack of, Clothing and all his belongings were gone. And she was quite upset. And I took her car and drove to my father's work. And I sat down in front of him at 15 and I said, listen, seems as though somebody stole all your clothes out of the closet. And, um, and he said, uh, he said, yeah, yeah. He said, I, I'm done. I can't, I can't do it anymore. I can't, I can't live it anymore. You're the man, you're the man now. And uh, those words didn't, didn't quite sit well with me. I, I, I didn't feel like I was ready to hear those words, but that's what I got. Um, then my mom got very, went into a very, very dark, a uh, place, a very deep, dark depression, as you can imagine, and um, and uh, she. One afternoon, I woke up. I, I'd, I'd fallen asleep, and I woke up and walked out into the living room, and I saw my my mother, um, like. Uh, very feebly, um, and like almost, it was like a slow motion crawl. It, it, if I could stand up, I could show you just the, what I saw. Do you mind? Do you no, mind? you can stand up. Thank you. Um, I saw, I saw my, my mother You know, in that in that mode. So instantly, I knew that something was dreadfully wrong, and um, there's 
drool coming out of her mouth. And as I was about to run and call, the front door busted open and uh, my uncle and uh, two paramedics came in and um, threw on the gurney and whisked her out of the house to get her to the hospital to, um, to pump her stomach. She'd, uh, she had uh, swallowed uh, a multitude of, of pills to, to, to try to take herself out tried to commit suicide and uh, when she got out of the hospital she was a small firecracker of a woman she was about five foot two but when she got out of the hospital the depression was so deep she she was down to like she lived on the couch and she weighed about 70 pounds and that, all that imagery spun into my head at that time that I thought that was a very, in my head at the time, I thought that that was a cowardly way for my father to have left. And I, I, I was uh, deeply upset by that um, until my father and I had a conversation um, years later where I asked him what really happened, what, how did it happen when I was older, and he told me the story. Your Honor, may we approach? Sure. Mr. Duff, how did you feel about your father when he left? I was, I was, I was, I was very disappointed in him because I started to believe that his exit was, was sneaky, cowardly. He didn't, when he said goodbye to me, when he left for work that morning, he said goodbye, you know, goodbye, Bob, and I went, see you later, Pop, that was it, until... Um, I learned the truth from, uh, from him. And without getting into what your father told you, why is, how, how has your um, impression of your father changed now? Objection relevance. Your Honor, this is just an understanding of his perception of his family. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Mr. Depp, what have you learned from um, your experience in your childhood and observing your father in your childhood? I learned that I was wrong about my first impressions of his, his exit from the family. Um, very wrong. And... Um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing I, that I learned that was, that was uh, one of the best lessons I believe I've ever learned in my life, ever could learn in, your life, in my life, was um, based on my experiences as, as a child and what I'd seen and experienced, I knew exactly how to raise children um, when when uh, when my girl Vanessa got pregnant, um, I knew exactly how to raise children, which was to do the opposite of what they did, of what Betty Sue did. Never raise your voice in front of the children. Never. Um, screaming out the word no to them. I never wanted to tell my kids no. I, I, I wanted to tell them that. I wanted to show them that there were options. You don't have to stick the coat hanger in the electrical socket. You know, saying no 
is an abrupt thing, but to talk to them and say, if you understand the repercussions of something, then you won't go there. So maybe think about this as opposed to this. Give this some thought, you know? But that will clearly, um, that could kill you. So I, I would ease them away from um, things of that nature with a more, more of an, more of a conversation as opposed to a, 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 you know, a flat out, don't you ever do that again and threats and things of that nature. I, I did not raise my children that way. Nor, nor did Vanessa. We, and we never raised our voices in front of our children ever. How do you and, think your experiences with your parents in your childhood affected your approach to your relationship with Miss Hurd? I'm sorry, um, one more time. How did your experiences observing your parents as a child affect your approach to your relationship with Miss Hurd? Well, in the beginning of my relationship with Miss Hurd, um, there was, from what I recall and what I remember she was she was um it was as if she were it was she was too good to be true um she was attentive she was loving um she was smart she was kind she was funny she was understanding she um, and, and we, we, we had many things in common, certain blues music and, well, music, literature, things of that nature. So for that year or year and a half, it was, uh, it was amazing. Um, there were a couple of things that, I don't know, stuck in my head that I, noticed that I thought might be a little bit of a, a dilemma at some point. For, ex for example, <clears throat> if I, if I, I, w I, was, I worked quite a lot, and when I would come home from work, um, I, would, I would come in the house or the hotel, or, and she would sit me down on the couch and give me a glass of wine and uh, take my boots off, set them to the side, and um, I'd never experienced anything like that in, in, in my life. I, I, I just never thought that was, I just never experienced that before. And it became a regular thing. Um, that she did, uh, this kind of routine. And I remember one night I came home from work and, uh, and I think she was on the phone or something and or busy, she was doing something. And um, so I sat down on the couch and I took my boots off and um, suddenly Miss Hurd approached with this look on her face that she, and she just said, what did you just do? What did you do? I said, what, what, what do you mean? You took your boots off. I said, I said yeah, yes, I did. You, 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 you were busy, you know. No, 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 that's my job. That's what I do. You don't do that. I do that. Okay, all right then. And then she said, let me get you a glass of wine. And she brought me the glass of wine. But I did take pause, of course, at the fact that she was visibly shaken or upset that I had, uh, I had broken her rules of routine. 
I thought that strange. And then once that, once you notice something like that, then you start to notice other little tidbits and things that come out. And then, and then uh, within a year, a year and a half, she had become this, this another person almost. Mr. Depp, we're going to talk about Ms. Hurd in a, a couple minutes, but I'd like to first talk about um, your career in Hollywood. And so could you please tell the jury how you ended up acting in the first place? Um, I ended up acting by accident. I uh, was a musician and I'd moved out to Los Angeles with my band uh, when I was 20 years old. Um, and then there were a couple of uh, things that happened in the band where the band split up. And uh, I remember I was filling out job applications and then Nick, uh, uh, with a friend of mine and who happens to be, he, happened, he was an actor uh, less known then than he is now, Nicolas Cage. Um, and I was filling out job applications at any, you know, video stores, clothing stores, anything, and just to be able to pay the rent. And um, Nick Cage said, uh, you know, wh why don't you meet my agent, you know, because uh, I, I, I think you're an actor. I think you could be an actor. And I said, look, I, I'll meet anybody, you know. I'll do anything at this point. And so he sent me to his his agent, Eileen Feldman, and I met with her. Um, she sent me to read for a, uh, a casting director named Annette Benson, who was casting a film called The Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, and uh, they brought me back to read for the director, Wes Craven. And um, I read for Wes uh, Craven, and somehow got the job but I mean I was by no means an actor I didn't have any desire to be an actor I was a musician uh, but the fact that these people were going to pay me what I found to be a ludicrous sum of money which was uh, it was kind of the sag minimum uh, it was twelve hundred and eighty-four dollars a week, which I, I mean, you know, I'd never seen that kind of dough before in my life. Um, and so I, I suddenly, you know, and then I did some other couple of dumb movies because I, I, I still in my mind I was. A musician and this was just a way to uh, pay the rent, pay the bills, live. Um, then suddenly I found myself on that road. I had been placed on that road uh, as, a, as an actor and, and then I, one thing led to another from film to film and then I uh, was cast in a TV series called 21 Jump Street when I was 22, I believe. Mr. Depp, between the time that you um, were cast in Nightmare on Elm Street and you um, were cast in 21 Jump, Jump Street, mm -hmm. how did you enjoy acting during that time? It was foreign to me. It was foreign to me, but I, I, didn't, I, did, I didn't have any great ambition to be an actor. I, I'm a, a naturally, normally, I'm, I'm uh, I've always been quite a shy person. I've always been quite introverted. And so there was a very strange metamorphosis from being one of four that is to say, one of four in a band where you have this fraternity or this brotherhood. Um, 
and you're out there fighting the world together to try to get that record deal or whatever you're looking for. And uh, when the when, when, when I got on this series and my life started to change in various ways, that is to say that people started to, you know, you go into a restaurant and you'd see people whispering and pointing and all that. I, I was... Uh, I was very uncomfortable with it. I was very uncomfortable with it, and I didn't like it. Um, just, just because it, I, I, ne I never wanted to be the lead singer and the guy out front and uh, we'll, we'll get all the attention. And I, I didn't. So suddenly, I was on my own, and I was uh, having to deal with this. Uh, this, this this newfound sort of notoriety, and it was it was odd. It was very odd, and it was yeah, it was a very uncomfortable thing. I, I mean, it, I don't think it's anything that one can get used to. I don't. I, I wouldn't. I'm not. I'm still not used to it now. And I, which I'm actually glad that I'm not used to it, because if I were, I don't think I'd be the same person that I am. Mr. Depp, did there come a time when you became passionate about acting? Once I realized that, I, that that's the road that I was on and that any attempt at going back to music would, would be a, um, and on, and not, it would have been, I hated the idea that since the television series had come out and I had been exposed as this, this, this character or this actor, uh, um, I had to realize in, in my own mind and heart that there was no going back to music because I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to use whatever amount of success that I had um, attained from the TV series and that sort of thing. I didn't want to use that to influence, um, you, you know, some career in music. I. I I had far too much respect for uh, music um, than to just uh, become what they wanted me to become, which was a you know teen idol or a teeny you know that that's that sort of thing. I um, I fought that with uh, with everything in my being. So once I realized that music was no longer uh, an option, then. Um, I began to uh, study um, at various places, you know, the Loft Studio, which is now long gone um, in, in Los Angeles. I, uh, I studied with uh, some other teachers, uh, Sandra Seacat. Um, I read all the books that you could read, and all that was great, but um, you realize that the only way to the only way to l l learn or, or the, the only way to learn how to it's not act necessarily the only way to learn how to react and behave because it's just behavior and it's reaction um, was to do it it, it you it's on the job training. It's trial by fire. So um, I did my best to to work up work my work up my own approach towards the towards uh, a character and such. And what were a couple of the first few uh, projects that you worked on where you were really able to implement that approach? I would say. I, I, I would say that the, fir the f first 
film that I had done that I really took um, where I really felt okay I've done the work I, 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 I know what I need to do um, I would say that was that, that where I considered myself an actor I suppose was 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 when um, Oliver Stone cast me in uh, platoon in 1986 How did you come to be cast in Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh, well, that's, that's many years later, but uh, I, I had been, um, Disney had offered me a film um, called Hidalgo, I, when it was a, about a man and his horse in the desert and stuff. And I, I, I read the, uh, the screenplay and I just didn't think it was for me. Um, but I wanted to have a meeting with them because I, at that point I had a um, two-year-old, uh, yeah, two, two, two and a half year old daughter, and so, or three, and, 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 and for three years I watched nothing but animated films, um, uh, cartoons from Tex Avery to Bugs Bunny to um, that, that, that that was all I, I I watched with my with my little girl and I received the screenplay for Pirates and it, it was uh, I, I somehow in my mind I saw this opportunity, like a, a way to mesh characters like car like cartoon characters. For example, Wile E. Coyote gets a boulder dropped on his head and he's completely crushed, but in the, they cut to the next scene and he's just got a little bandage on his head. So I, I started thinking about the, the parameters uh, that are that were available to cartoon characters, and if they were available to cartoon characters, and 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 nobody ever asked a question whether you were five or ninety-five, you didn't ask a question. Oh, Wiley Coyote! Of course, he's still alive. So I tried to incorporate these uh, these kind of ideas into the character of Captain Jack Sparrow so that so, 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 so that I could try to push those parameters and 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 control the sort of suspension of disbelief the, to be able to control the um, characters actions words movements and put them in a place where the things that he would do or say were so either ludicrous or um, mainly something that also something to, to, the cartoon characters can get away with things we can't. Captain Jack Sparrow can do things that I could never do. He could say things that I could never say. So it was for me a way to stretch the parameters of, of a character and uh, uh, and take uh, take a risk uh, in doing that. But if it if it panned out, I, 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 and I felt I was on a pretty good mission, if it panned out, I thought that it might be a character who would be accepted by five-year-olds and. 45 year olds and 65 year olds and 85 year olds and in the same way that Bugs Bunny is uh, you know you mentioned believed. that sorry you mentioned mm. that you received the script when was that I'm sorry when did you first receive the script for Pirates of the Caribbean uh, the, the the first screenplay I, I received was uh, 2002 I believe yeah 2002. 
And what did you think of that script when you received it? Um, I thought that it had all the kind of hallmarks of a of a of a Disney film. That is to say, a kind of a predict predictable <coughs> predictable three act structure um, with uh, with and the character of Captain Jack was was more. Um, he was more like a swashbuckler type that would kind of swing in shirtless and, you know, be the hero. Um, and I, I had quite different ideas about the character, so I incorporated my notes into the character and brought that character to life, um, much to the chagrin of Disney initially. Now, when you say you made changes to the character, how did you do that? Um, just, you know, in, in preparation, you know, the, 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 the same, the very same way that I've ever approached any character. You, you, you look for a back history, you base it on, um, you know, it could be anything like Edward Scissorhands, for example, was I based on a, a dog that I'd had and uh, newborn babies. My sister had, had a couple of new babies and I watched them, you know, and I, because I thought that Edward would see things from the, the sort of, un the, uh, from a place of innocence um, and n not knowing exactly what things meant or were and and also that that look of uh, a, a pure innocent child when they experience something for the first time um, those those were the the two main ingredients that I th thought would serve the character and with Captain Jack again the cartoons you know the, the Pepe Le Pew. It was a, it was a. Uh, it, it's like it's like making a soup. You know, it's ingredients. It's just ingredients. Um, there's some Pepe Le Pew in there. There's some Keith Richards in there. Um, there's a bit of a. You, you, you know, I figured this is a guy who's been on the sea for the majority of his life, quite possibly his brains may have been scrambled a bit by the sun. And also I thought that he'd been on the sea for so long that he had his sea legs, but when he got on land, he just didn't have his land legs. So he could never quite <laughs> stand still. How did the film ultimately turn out in your view? Um, I didn't see it, but uh, I believe that the film, well, I mean, the film did pretty well, apparently, and uh, and uh, they wanted to keep going, uh, making, uh, making more, and I was fine to do that, uh, as uh, it was, it, there's great freedom in, in being able to, it's not like you become that person, but if you, if you know that character, it, it, to the degree that I did, because he was not what the writers wrote, so they really weren't able to write for him. So once you know a character better than the writers, that's when you, um, you have to uh, uh, be true to the character and add your words. At, at, the, at the rewrites, um, I was, uh, I, yeah, no, I, I, I believed in the character wholeheartedly, and the uh, initially the Disney uh, folks were somewhat upset. 
Now, you mentioned that the film was, to your understanding, a great success. How did your life change after the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie came out? Um, though I'd been around for many years already, and, uh, and uh, people people knew who I was and all that. Um, after Pirates 1 came out, there was a, a, a completely different, it was a completely different uh, way of life was, was, was being sort of, you know, my family and I were being plunged into. That is to say, you know, at our house in Los Angeles, you would have, you would have people trying to climb the gates to get into see Captain Jack Sparrow. Um, you would you would have people trying to bust in the gates dressed as Captain Jack Sparrow. You would have it, it and follow you or follow you and your family. So that was that was the moment when um, th th there was no other way but to uh, we we had to hire more security guards, and I was certainly worried for my kids. Um, safety, and so then we. That's when the instead of just the one guy, there were there. You know, there were start, there became several security people, because I wanted to make sure that my kids were safe when they went to school or when they went to Disneyland or when they went to the mall or whatever. Um, so yes, more security and, you know, then just getting followed, you know, by hordes of paparazzi and things like that. It's, 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 uh, I've had worse jobs, certainly. I can't complain about it, but, um, yeah, uh, after a while you realize that, uh, um, anonymity, uh, has left the building. A long time ago, you know, the anonymity's gone, um, and that's a that's an odd thing to deal with. Um, when you just, I mean, you can't just drive down to the diner and get a cup of coffee or something. It's not uh, possible. It, it it turns into something else altogether. So it's, you know, it's acceptance, and there's, of course, there's a bit of sacrifice. Uh, involved. I, I, I can't complain about the uh, work that I've been given. I can't complain about any of that. Um, I have no right to. Um, but it, it, it does make you have to think very creatively with when you've got little kids about how to take them to the park or, you know, to the swings, or to the this or that, or movie, or, you know, it becomes, a, it becomes a strategic mission. And, 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 and that's what happened after Pirates. Now, you mentioned your family. Who did your family consist of at that time? My, my, Vanessa, um, Parody, the mother of my children, um, who we were together for 14, 15 years. Um, myself, uh, our daughter, Lily Rose, and um, our boy, Jack. Now, you mentioned hiring more security. Did you already have a security team at the time that Pirates of the Caribbean came out? I'd had, I, yes, because there had been there have been more films prior to that, I mean, a number of films prior to that, so uh, I was, I was uh, recognized and I was known, so if you wanted to attempt to have any experience that might be normal, you, you sort of had to have somebody around to uh, get you out of a squirrely situation should it arise. So I had security prior to that f for who would travel with myself and my family. 
Um, but not like, you know, when I was at work, I, back then I didn't have security at work so much, you know, anything, not before Pirates. Pirates was really the, uh, that was the thing that everything, um, it, it all turned around. It all just went, went uh, weird. So how did your security team change after Pirates of the Caribbean came out? Well, like I said, with anything, it, it had it, it become more strategic, and you had to have more guys or gals uh, because um, because if if Vanessa, if Vanessa, for example, she worked in France quite a lot, and if she was in France, um, and and. I was in LA with the kiddies, then, um, and working, um, security would, uh, w security would basically pick my kids up at school or whatever and bring them home. So that became the routine, driving them to school, bringing them home. Um, um, so, 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 yeah, and then if I went somewhere, so, so the, it just, the security guards kind of multiplied because you needed to protect your street, your house, your kids. Endless. So after Pirates of the Caribbean, who has been on your security team? Um... Jerry Judge was was with me for oh boy over twenty years. Um, Jerry Judge uh, is, is you, we mentioned it before. He um, uh, it was a year or two ago. He, um, he it, Jerry would go on film sets with me. He would he would do reconnaissance missions. You know that is to say he would go to a country before we would go there make sure all the hotel rooms were all taken care of and such. Um, or when I went on tour with, uh, say, the Hollywood Vampires, uh, um, which is a, a, a band that I've played with, um, he would come on the road with me with another security um, guard. Uh, so there was Jerry Judge, there was Malcolm Connolly, who's been with me for 20 years or more. Um, Leonard Damien, Sean Bett, um, Travis uh, McGivern, um, Mark Gibbs. I, I mean, there are a few. Are all of these uh, security personnel still with you today? Jerry has gone on to uh, somewhere else. He's, Jerry made, uh, Jerry, Jerry passed away uh, from cancer, so Jerry, Jerry made his exit. Um, but the majority of those, no, the, I believe all of those fellows are still with me, yes. When did Mr. Judge pass away? I, th I believe it was two, Two years ago, roughly, maybe a little less than two years ago. Um, now I'd like to go through a couple of the names that you just mentioned. Um, what is Malcolm Conley's purview in, in the realm of your security team? What is his role? Exactly, yes. Um, well, uh, now that Jerry is... Um, Jerry and Malcolm had worked together for a very long time, so I'd met Malcolm through Jerry. Um, after after Jerry's passing, Malcolm obviously took over um, for Jerry, and so he would uh, he would uh, he took on extra uh, responsibilities. He would have to make sure that there was someone on the ground 
wherever we were going that had done their their uh, um, recon, you know, the reconnaissance and to make sure that uh, um, everything was set up by the time we got there and that it would be a straight shot into the hotel without a gaggle of paparazzi. Um, you know, you didn't have to walk through 50 screaming, hollering photographers. So, you, you know, you go in through a garage door and through a slippery kitchen and you were, then you were taken to your room where you stayed. <laughs> when, did, uh, when did Malcolm Conley join your team? Malcolm had joined, I mean, Jerry brought him on, so Malcolm has been with me for over 20 years uh, now. And in those 20 years, how often have you physically been present with Malcolm? With Malcolm? Endless, countless, all over the world, um, all over the world, uh, everywhere. Los Angeles, J Japan, um, Serbia, um, you know, films, tour. Um, Malcolm was my, uh, he, you know, he, 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 when we were on the Vampires tour in Europe, throughout Europe, and Malcolm was on the bus with me. We, we lived on the bus together, basically. How often is Malcolm in L.A. with you? It, it depends if, if there's a, or if there was a, a, a larger premiere, you know, where, um, you know, where it, it had to be worked out so that it didn't turn into a chaotic uh, or, and or dangerous event because sometimes there are, between you and the people there are these barriers and uh, sometimes the professional uh, photographers or the professional autograph people will surge forward and in the front rows of these, behind these barriers, you have, you have little kids and older women and older men and so when the professionals would surge forward these people would start getting kind of crushed against the this metal deterrent and um that 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 was the that was the most uh worrisome thing when 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 you're at a premiere and there are thousands and thousands of people there, and I've always called it running the gauntlet. Essentially, what it is is that people are there to um, to say hi and to support uh, the film or the cast or whatever. So I um, have always gone out and and signed for those people. I've always gone out and signed for all or as many as I possibly could. I mean, to the point of sometimes Jerry Judge would literally pick me up off the ground to make me stop signing and take me away. Um, um, so, yeah, uh, it was, uh, those, those, those kind of things, again, you don't you don't really get used to that, you know. Um, so I, I forget what the original part of your question was. I, I got lost in the gauntlet. Uh, I'll move on. What uh, what about well, Sean Bed? How long is you want to go ahead and make a, take a break now? Would that be okay for afternoon That's break? Fine. That's Let's fine. Go, why don't we go ahead and, and do that, ladies and gentlemen? We'll go ahead and take our afternoon break. Please do. Uh, we'll take fifteen minutes. Do not discuss. Uh, the case and do not do any outside research, okay? Thank you. Mr. Depp, I'd like to just briefly go through the security personnel that you just listed out before we took a break. Um, how long has Leonard Damien be, been with you? My, my kids are now 20, 
23, Leonard's, Leonard Damien's been with me, I believe, roughly the same time as Mr. Bat, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 16, 17 years. I, uh, I, I, yeah, I can't be precise, but they were very young. My children were very young when, when they uh, joined the team, which was re really after Pirates was released in 2003, the first. Now you mentioned your children. Is it, What is uh, Mr. Damien's role with respect to your children's security? Excuse me? You mentioned your children yes. with respect to Leonard Damien. Is his role in connection with your children's security? Uh, y yes. Very much so. Leonard, um, <clears throat> Leonard is yes, Leonard Damien, and um, and Sean Bet for for uh, uh, quite a while. We're both um, sort of assigned, as it were, to to my kids, um, uh, taking them to school, picking them up from school if if. Uh, Vanessa and I were unable to do it, or even if we were there, we would drive with them um, to take the kids to school. Um, and over the the years, obviously, your your children, uh, my children have have uh, taken uh, quite a shine to 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 them, and they've become like. Um, another set of parents in a way. And how long has Travis McGivern been with you? Travis, I believe a little bit l less than that, I believe. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't really speculate. Uh, if it's a little less, maybe it's 13 years, or I don't know. Now, you mentioned that you had to bring on additional security after Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, yes. How has the fame associated with that, th that franchise affected your, your personal relationships? Um, again, I, 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 I would never complain about the re the repercussions, let's say, or yeah, the, the repercussions of um, the success of that film. Um, but of course, as I said, there are sacrifices that w one <clears throat> one has to make. Um, sacrifices that you're you're not nearly ready for. Um, just simply when, when you check into a, when you go to a town or you go on a press tour or something and you're staying in a hotel, people stay in hotels all the time. I stay, <laughs> I stay in the hotel. I, it's, it's uh, we've found that it's just a lot easier if I stay put in a hotel and um, not kind of again, especially if it's with the kids or something. I don't want them to. I, I've never wanted them to see me as as a novelty. I just wanted to be dad, you know. Um, now. They're well aware of uh, a lot, and uh, they're well aware of pretty much everything. Um, but no, you, you you know you when you get when you get recognized uh, wherever you go, um, the, the the basic the basic truth is it's it's, it's pretty simple. People are generally kind and curious. Um, and if, if you've 
if, if they've grown up with you in their living room um, from a television series or from various films that, that they've seen, um, there's, there's nothing menacing about being recognized. Sometimes it can be. Sometimes people can get go get weird and but but uh, um, we've found that it's it's just uh, it's it's better all around if if I um, stay in my hotel room and uh, and don't go out uh, to too many restaurants or anything because. It, it generally causes a bit of a hubbub. If you go to a restaurant, someone calls the paparazzi and you go in for a meal and you come out and there's 30 guys out there. It's, uh, it can be um, a little overwhelming. It's not, it's not something, I think I said it before, it's, it's not something that I, that, that it's not something that I've ever gotten used to, and it's something that I hope I never get used to. Um, because I, I don't think of myself in those terms. I used to be, um, I used to be Johnny, if, if, if that makes sense. I used to be Johnny, and then my name full name, which I, I, I honestly find still, it's difficult, it's, if I, it's uncomfortable to say my own name, because I, when, when I say it, I hear the commodity, I hear the product, so I just, I went from Johnny to Johnny Depp, and, um, and then that name um, with that name, Johnny Depp, and some image was cultivated, um, certainly not by me, but, but, but uh, the, the, the media, um, especially in those days, they, they must label you. They have to give you a label. Um, and labels are one of the things that I've fought vigorously with regard to my work I I, I never wanted to be um, <clears throat> the poster boy I never w wanted to be the uh, I don't have I, you know I'm not built with that kind of hubris I don't I don't have that kind of uh, 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 confidence I, I, I can do virtually anything playing a character. I can become the character in my work. Um, and that character may be able to, he may be able to spit out a hundred words a minute, but me, myself, Johnny, I uh, cannot. <laughs> so the, the, therein lies the difference, you know. Mr. Depp, other than acting, what other artistic pursuits do you have that may be a little less known to the general public? Well, I've remained uh, a, a musician. I've been a musician. Um, I started playing the guitar when I was 12 years old, and uh, that saved my life because I locked myself into a, in, in my bedroom um, at the age of 12, uh, listening to, r r you know, records, moving the needle back and then learning that piece and then learning it again. So, uh, so much so, to, I mean, th that I, 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 I don't remember, uh, I, I, I have no memory of going through puberty. I, 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 uh, I was just playing the guitar. I was just... I was obsessed with uh, my guitar. Any other artistic pursuits? Um, 
I, yeah, I mean, I've always drawn since I was very small, since I was very little, um, and always enjoyed drawing, and then began to paint. Um, and so they started learning about painting and trying to, um, um, it, it, I suppose, different ways of, of expressing oneself, different ways to, different ways to um, release um, the things that are living in, in, in your head, whether they be beautiful memories, whether they be horrific memories, whether they be, um, I, 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 I have a, um, I need to create. It's it's a need. It's a. Of course, I want to create as well, but I I, I actually need to create because I need to summon whatever whatever it is that I need to summon to whether and whether that's within a film or a, a painting or a guitar note. Um, all of those things sh should come from a place uh, of, of the, an organic place, a place of truth. Um, because if they don't, well, then you're just lying, aren't you? I, I, every, bit of truth the person doesn't have to say anything on film um, what's important is what's behind the eyes and if they do say something what's important is not necessarily the words that they say it's very easy to say I love you but what brings it into the realm of truth is what's underneath it, what's not being said, the subtext, if you will. So um, any artistic or creative venture, any film, anything that I do, that's, um, that's where I'm coming from. That's, that's my approach. Mr. Duff, you mentioned words, and I think the jury has already seen um, some words that you've written in text messages. Yes. Um, can you please tell the jury a little bit about how you write? I, certainly. I, um, when I was young, when I was about 12 years old, my, my elder brother, um, Danny, um, walked into my room and ripped the Peter Frampton record off my record player, threw it across the room, and said, you gotta stop listening to this stuff. And he put this record on and it started and I'd never heard anything like it. It was called uh, Astral Weeks by Van Morrison. So I'm a kid, you know, 12 years old. So my brother turned me on to Van Morrison then he turned me on to soundtracks like Clockwork Orange or uh, um, um, Last Tango in Paris. Or, um, he turned me on to books by Jack Kerouac. He turned me on to books by Ginsburg, um, Philip K. Dick. I mean, he, Salinger. I mean, the whole James Joyce, the whole Hemingway, the whole thing. So, um, so I became very interested in yeah, vocabulary and and the 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 unique voices of these writers. Um, and then I started reading people like Tom Robbins and Hunter S. Thompson, and then ended up becoming very close uh, friends with, with, um, with Hunter Thompson f for the last uh, 10, 12 years of his life. And uh, Hunter's writing, of course, because of the amount I spent 
of, t of time I spent with him it has influenced my writing uh, greatly. Hunter was known for inventing a thing called gonzo journalism, which is it's 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 uh, the author putting himself in the situation um, uh, as opposed to writing it from the author's point of view. He writes it with him in it. Um, and it, it, there are great um, embellishments and uh, embellishments are great sort of ways that he would twist things and um, express um, his, 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 his feelings. Um, and so he, he became a huge hero, of course, to me, and a, a great friend. I, uh, uh, in my texts and in my emails, or sometimes just even in my writing, um, you do, you take, you, you, you take the subject and you, um, try to express it in your own vernacular and, and in that, um, as, for example, with the text messages that, that, that I apologize that everyone's had to uh, experience. I am ashamed of, uh, of some of the references uh, made. I'm uh, embarrassed that at the time, the heat of the moment, um, the heat of uh, the pain um, that I was feeling, um, went to went to dark places. There is no. If you're writing, there is no set place that you have to stay in. You can travel, and sometimes. Um, Pain can be, has to be dealt with, with humor, and sometimes dark, very dark humor. Um, I, I, I grew up watching Monty Python, I, I, you know, so yes, it, it, it can tend to get into dark uh, humor. It can uh, tend to get. Uh, um, words are used that for emphasis um, and words are used to express what what you're feeling at the time and um, it's just like growing up you learn from those mistakes you learn from those things, and um, you move forward, you know? Um, and that, that's how you, that's how you start to understand your own vernacular, and what's important, you know, what's necessary, and what's not necessary, um, I tend to be quite expressive in my writing, and w after um, <clears throat> after the uh, after the unfortunate um, words of m Ms. Heard. Um, um, made their way into my heart um, and my head. Those are, those are two very opposing 
things. So you're you're trying to you you you're trying to find the best way to express something to a friend. Sometimes you're exaggerating, uh, you know, something that you've done, um, um, just to make it sound, just to make him understand that. Uh, uh, you know, I'm on I'm on planet question mark here. I don't know what's going on, and I, but I know I'm in this situation, and I know that it cannot continue. Mr. Depp, the the jury's heard quite a bit from Miss Hurd's side about your drug and alcohol use but I'm sure they'd like to hear from you. So could you please just tell them about your history of substance use? Certainly. Um, again, this, this goes back to when I was a, a young boy. Um, excuse me. Um, at about the age of, I don't know, four or five years old, I, I can remember vividly my, my mom telling me to go get her nerve pills, you know, um, out of her purse that was hanging on the back of the door. So I'd go get the nerve pills and I'd bring her the nerve pill, she'd take it. And, um, you know, after a few years, you start to notice well, you start to think about nerve pills, nerve pills. <laughs> and then she seemed to calm down after she took those nerve pills. So when I was 11 years old, um, I wanted to calm down. And I didn't know how to. So I, I'd bring my mom her nerve pill walk away and I would take one myself um, to escape caring so much, feeling so much, uh, to escape the, the, the chaotic um, nature of, of what of what we were living uh, through um, so that 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 was the beginning when I realized that nerve pills calm the nerves um, pretty young age to do that I uh, I can't say that I'm proud of admitting to that, but, but I, I have to say that I knew not what else to do. I knew nothing else that I could do. Um, so as we were all growing up, there was always those kids who would say, let's party. Let's go party. I want to party. I've never used the word party in my life. I've never, I've never taken any substance uh, for a party. I have taken these substances over the years on and off um, to numb, to numb myself of, of, uh, of the, the ghosts, the wraiths that were still with me and um, from, from, from my youth. So um, it, it, I needed, yeah, I, 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 they were everything. It, it was essentially, it was just self-medication. Um, one of those get me out of here moments and the, you know where you want to escape from is your own brain your own head how often have you used substances throughout your life um having 
started with my, my mother's nerve pills at 11. Of course, the, 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 you know, that's around the age that um, you're introduced to uh, marijuana. Um, you're introduced to, and also depending on the, where you're living and who you're um, associating with, and who's around the neighborhood. Um, I, no, I wasn't shy to uh, try a substance for, to see if the effect of it would maybe even take a bit more of the edge off. So I, I, I started um, at 11 and I mean, I even mentioned this in an interview in TV Guide, if anyone remembers TV Guide, um, in 1989, where I was asked by the journalist um, why I believed that um, kids who were watching the show, 21 Jump Street, about police officers in school under, as un undercover, uh, undercover cops, but, uh, but as students, um, I was asked why people, why these kids or whoever should 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 believe me or trust me or listen to me, and I said, look, I I I could uh, because I've experienced it, and I can tell them. that there is no future in it, that there's nothing but a, 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 a kind of an, a postponing of the inevitable. That one day you're going to have to face those feelings. One day you will meet those, let's call them uh, demons um, from your youth. Um, so I, I was, I was, I was, straight up open and honest at, at that time in, in, in a very, I mean, TV Guide was, uh, it was right at the register when you checked out at the grocery store. It was like the most popular thing and, and it was a very straight magazine, uh, little magazine. But I, 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 I told them I'd pretty much done all the drugs that I was aware of by the time I was 15 years old. Um, and which was true. Um, now, that doesn't mean to say that I continued in, in, into that, you know, forest of, of uh, possibilities with regard to substances. Um, I wasn't uh, um, dropping acid every five minutes. I wasn't I, I, there were many years that I didn't touch a substance and no drugs. There were many years that I uh, didn't have a drink. Um, so it's, as I said, it, it, it's never been for the sort of party effect. It's been for trying to Numb the things inside that have that that that, that plague that, that can plague plague someone's uh, uh, who's who's experienced trauma. Um, but it, the the characterization um, of 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 the, the characterization of my substance, quote unquote, substance abuse um, that's been delivered by uh, Ms. Hurd is, is, uh, is, 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 a, is grossly embellished. Um, and I'm sorry to say, but, um, a lot of it is uh, is just plainly false. 
I think that it was easy. It was an easy. Uh, I think it was an easy target for her to hit because once you've trusted somebody for a certain amount of years and you've told them all the secrets of your life, um, that information then, of course, can be used against you, especially if it's taken to a point that is teetering on impossible, uh, uh, and teeters over impossible, in fact, at times. It's so I, I, I am not um, some maniac who needs um, to be high or loaded all the time. I, I in fact, the, 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 the In Australia, from before Australia and in Australia, I had been um, off off of alcohol for I believe it was about eighteen months. Mr. Depp, you've mentioned some periods of sobriety throughout your life. How many would you estimate you've had? Uh, quite, uh, quite a number. Uh, you know, it, it, on on various films, you see. Um, I suppose, I guess, maybe by example, if, if anyone's, uh, well, if you're familiar with Hunter Thompson's book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which I, I was uh, lucky enough to make uh, into a film and, and, uh, with Terry Gilliam, the, the film calls for myself and my attorney to be absolutely blotto out of our heads constantly uh, throughout the film, and most people just assume that, well, they just got wasted and they filmed them. There would have been no way to, you couldn't act that, you couldn't, I mean, you couldn't make that film with two actors who were loaded, there would be no way. Um, and then to the other extreme, Donnie Brasco, uh, a film that I made about a, an FBI agent I, I I had to uh, uh, I had to go in, go into a training regime where I, I I had to eat five meals a day, drink five shakes a day, you know these protein shakes per day, um, work out three to four hours a day because I had to gain twenty to thirty pounds of muscle. Uh, um, uh, there was certainly. No, no abuse of um, substances uh, then. Uh, I, there's been no abuse of substances on film sets. There have been no, uh, there's been no, there's been no moments where I would have been considered out of control, never. In fact, it's not been mentioned that, I'm sure they don't want to mention it, but I remember that because we, when I was with Ms. Hurd um, and her friends and we were all drinking wine um, and I smoking um, marijuana um, they would. They used to tease me because the, because of uh, what they said was a, a, a ludicrous tolerance. Because I because I never appeared loaded or high or any of that. I I. I um, Even if even if I felt a little spinny, I know no one would have ever known. You know. 
Mr. Depp, is there any substance that you've ever been addicted to? Yes. And, and what is that? Um, Roxycodone or Roxycontin, which is um, it's an opiate. It's um, I think I think oxycodone has the opiate and then some pain like a paracetamol or something, and, and then the roxies are just the opiate, as far as I uh, remember. And um, when I was I was working on Pirates Four, and uh, there there was a scene in which I had to um, grab this large gold and uh, gold and red, you know, stately gilt chair, pick it up and throw it, chuck it out this uh, big giant window. And so I did it, and as I swung around to throw the, throw the chair out the window, um, I felt this immediate electricity from, from the bottom of my spine down to, down my left leg. Um, and it was like an electricity that burned it. it, it. So I had obviously done, it was sciatica, so I had obviously pinched something, done something. So I went to, I saw a chiropractor or a kine or whatever, I saw chiropractors and, and uh, to no avail. Uh, then I saw a doctor and, and uh, the only pain medication that she uh, recommended and prescribed to me was uh, uh, roxycodone. Um, and uh, there was a part of me that was a little bit worried just in a sense that I, I, I know um, I've witnessed uh, friends and people over the years who have um, who've had problems with uh, heroin you know um, and I, I didn't want to get bit by that snake and I started taking the Roxy's and uh, I was bit by the snake. And then before you know it, um, that, that monkey is on your back to stay. And it's not like you take those pills to get high. You, you take them to once, once, once the addiction has grabbed hold of you, you, you're not taking those pills to get high. You're, you're taking those pills to get uh, uh, well or to get better. Because if you're without the pill, your body will start to go into various. Uh, you'll, you'll withdrawals and um, so I was I was on the Roxy Roxy's for a number of years uh, four or five years I think maybe more I don't know but um, the key was that I I if you take two you will be um, what they call on the knot you will be that you you will just drop into sleep, um, uh, so um, yes, I, I, I didn't like being dependent on on these on these pills. I didn't like being dependent on on um, a, on a drug that would you take only so you wouldn't get withdrawals. That's what it becomes. It's like a junkie. The, the reason why so many uh, 
uh, well, now there's a huge fentanyl problem, but, but the reason why junkies generally, why they end up overdosing is because they're looking for the first high again. And you, you don't get that. You don't get your first high again. So what do you do? You up the stakes and you put more, you take more. And, and that's what makes uh, them, that's what makes things go dark for them. Because they overestimated the amount that they, that their body could tolerate. And they go blue and they die. So, um, yeah, didn't want that. Mr. Depp, do you have an estimate as to what year you started taking the the opiates that you just described? Um, when uh, two thousand, or excuse me, uh, it was pirates. Bless you. Four, I believe. Pirates four. No, it was Pirates four. Rob Marshall directed it. Um, I don't know what year that was. M maybe. I actually don't. I have no idea what year that was. Was it before you were in a relationship with Ms. Hurd? Yes. I believe so. And you didn't detox, and you detoxed from those opiates during your relationship with Ms. Hurd. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so they, of course, yes. So they must have, yeah, they did come around prior to my meeting, Ms. Hurd. After you detox from the opiates, have you ever taken any opiates ever again? No, I can't. That's a, no. Once you've been bit, you'll be bit again. So no, I, with any, I mean, even with my f finger, uh, I, I think that there was like Mot Motrin 800, uh, uh, you know, but n no opiates. No, I have not taken an opiate since, and I won't un unless I plan on going through the the hell of the, the pure horror of detoxing of coming off those drugs. No. no. Mr. Depp, I'd like to now turn to your relationship with Ms. Hurd. Um, can you please tell the jury how you met Ms. Hurd? Mm -hmm. um, 2000, in, in, in around 2008, uh, Hunter Thompson and I were going through some of his manuscripts uh, of his books that have been published. And then I, I found this manuscript in one of his boxes, and it was called The Rum Diary. And I had heard about it, and I knew it was what they called his long lost novel. In fact, the only novel he ever wrote. Um, and I showed it to him, and Hunter was Hunter was shocked. My God, that's where it is, you know. <laughs> and uh, so he said, read me some. So I started reading this to him. And he said, this is a movie. You know, we, we, we must produce this together. And you know, he got all excited about the, the idea of doing that. So we went right into it. And we started to um, set up meetings to, uh, to get to, to, to get money, uh, financing, to develop the project. And uh, we finally ended up getting the money to develop the project and to make the film. Um, Hunter, um, uh, from his own um, dilemmas in his, in his life, um, uh, committed suicide um, and uh, but I 
having had long, long talks with him, I knew every angle of the book, but I knew every angle of the film that he wanted, which was going to be a bit different than the book. And Bruce Robinson, who was a great writer, director, directed a film called With Nail and I and How to Get Ahead in Advertising, was the one director that Hunter and I talked about. And so I, I, I went to Bruce, who was a friend of mine, and I ripped him out of retirement because he never wanted to direct another film again. I pulled him out of retirement after 27 years, and uh, he agreed to write the screenplay and direct the film. And uh, we proceeded. Uh, during the auditioning process, um, Bruce, Bruce was, uh, for that Hunter, Hunter had very specific ideas of what these characters should be. Um, Bruce had been auditioning um, girls or women from, for, for the role of Ch uh, Chenault in the film. And there were the there were this sort of the starlets that that were up and coming, and or there were some that were well known and um, things of that nature. But you know, one of the things that Hunter was very against was stunt casting. That is to say, put a bunch of very famous people in a movie and well, let them go. And, and then hope for the money in the, in the end. So Bruce had asked me, he said he had been auditioning uh, this, this one particular actress named Amber Heard. Um, he said that he'd auditioned her five times and he was, um, He wasn't sure about her capabilities um, as an actress with regard to the film and the character and what and taking direction and that sort of thing. So he asked me if I would read with her for the for the film, and I had met already met a number of actresses and things. And, I, and so what I said to Mr. Robinson is I said, Bruce, I, I, I don't, if you've, if you've auditioned her five times, you've seen the best and the worst, I suppose. So me putting her, this, this girl in an uncomfortable situation, you know, saying, hey, all right, let's read this. I think is a, I think it's a, I think it's a far better idea that we just meet so that I can s see how she behaves, um, see how she reacts, because that's really all it is: reaction, behavior, and you don't have to push anything else, you know. Um, so I'm, they made a, an appointment. Uh, she she came to my office. I took one look at her and I thought, yep, yeah, that's 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 the Chenault that Hunter wants. That's the one. I just I thought, yeah, she could definitely kill me. That's uh, that's what Hunter wants. And so we spoke, and she was sweet as pie, pleasant. Again, you know, um, intelligent, literate, very good taste. Uh, um, and I felt like if she, what I felt and what I told Bruce was, look, when you put, some, when you put someone in a situation that, that, that they're obviously going to be, feel under pressure, um, it's not the best way to, to really to really know what they're capable of. And I made suggestions such as, um, and which I ended up making to Ms. Hurd, I made suggestions of films that 
might give her uh, uh, some insight into what, what we were looking for in terms of the film. Which is to say, I gave her films like To Have and Have Not um, and things of that nature be, 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 because I, I wanted to, there was something very important that she, I thought, felt she needed to know about stillness as opposed to, you know, uh, going broad or, or, or taking, acting a little too much. So I felt like I could, I felt like I could be a bit of a traffic cop in that sense, so that, because if we, if we could connect, then it would, it could work as long as there was truth in her eyes and as long as there was truth coming out of her uh, uh, dialogue, you know, then it's all in the editing. So I, 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 I felt that I could help her with that idea of stillness. Um, and so, so that's where I, that's when I first met Miss Heard. How would you describe your interactions with Ms. Hurd when you worked together on The Rum Diary? Um, initially, well, yeah, no, mostly very, very, very few interactions. Um, I remember there was a time, I wasn't working that day, but I was producing, you know, one of the producers of the film, <clears throat> and um, it was a scene from the book that that was it was a it was a it was a scene where Ms. Hurd's character was in a nightclub and w were amongst um, the locals and she's very drunk and everybody's very drunk and she ends up dancing with a few of the local, like one of the local guys and stuff, and then the other local guys start to sort of close in on her. In the book and in the screenplay as it was written, there was a, a, she, there was a, required, a, a requirement for nudity um, for the part. And uh, I was on set the day that they were shooting that. And as I, as I was watching the crowd coming in on her, I realized, you know what? Because I would check on Ms. Hurd and say, are you all right? Are you sure you're okay? Because this is, you know, she was like, no, no, I'm fine, fine, fine. But I realized that with the crowd surging in towards her, that we didn't have to do, we wouldn't have to do the nudity because if she, if she took, took her shirt off and she had uh, a red bra on um, and a skirt, then if she had a red bra in her hand, when the crowd surged in on her, all she had to do was lift the red bra up out of the crowd and there's no nudity, but it's certainly implied because then she disappears for the character disappears for a few days and um, and she's quite a wreck when she comes back because bad things have happened to her. So I, I remember telling Ms. Hurd, "Hey, you don't you don't have to." Uh, you don't have to take your clothes off. You don't have to take your top off. You don't have to, everything's cool. Um, and she was appreciative. Um, and, uh, but, but, but other than that, we didn't really um, have much interaction until, um, until there was a, um, a scene where I, I was, t I'm, I'm taking a shower and then she comes into the, 
room and she walks, opens the shower and we kiss. And uh, that moment was, um, it was, um, yeah, it, 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 it was, it, it was, it, it felt like something, um, it felt like something that I shouldn't be feeling because she had her wife um, and even though it was a scene and, and, and she had her wife and, and I had Vanessa and kitties and um, yeah. When would you say your romantic relationship with Miss Hurt actually began, if, if not in that moment? Well, I think there was something in the kiss, in the shower, that was very um, real. Um, so that day after work, Miss Hurt, uh, I'd come to my trailer and I was, uh, uh, I was, I was, uh, listen, I was just sitting there listening to, uh, actually old blues stuff. And, um, we had a glass of wine and, um, and and um, we kissed. Um, and at that point, we were the, my trailer was the only trailer in the parking lot. Um, she had a mind to stay in the trailer there for a while with me, and I uh, didn't think that was a very good idea on any level, especially since there were about nine Teamsters waiting to move the trailer. Um, and then that was that until to, to whenever the, uh, we did the first day of the press junket uh, for the Rum Diary in Los Angeles, uh, two years later. And um, she had, she had broken up, I believe, with her wife and my, uh, for lack of a, well, my wife, uh, we weren't married, married, but she was, of course, my wife, Vanessa. Um, had, we, we had had uh, some not so great um, situations, you know, um, she wanted, she needed, she needed, she was stuck in America. <laughs> she wanted to go back to France. She wanted to have her life back. Not long after, right, right around then is when <clears throat> Miss Hurd and I started to uh, see each other here and there occasionally. Um, between the end of the filming of The Rum Diary and the, the press junket, did you and Miss Hurd communicate at any time? in between? Mm -mm. I, I don't remember. I remember that there was a, a, there was a white dress that she was really, she really was infatuated with, that she really loved this dress that she wore in the film. And uh, so I, I went to Colleen Atwood, the costume designer, and to Bruce, and I said, do you think we can snag this, this white dress and send it to, uh, to Amber, uh, you know, after she'd wrapped? Because she loved the, she loved the thing. Um, I remember talking to her, I think, then, but uh, briefly, briefly. 
What did you like about Miss Heard when you first started your romantic relationship? She she seemed to be. She seemed to be the. Um, she, she seemed to be the perfect. Uh, partner in, in a sense f in my head and for me because she as I said she she was she seemed to be very knowledgeable about old obscure blues music that I listened to and really liked um, she was literate she was uh, sweet funny nice all those things you know um, and, and, and she was, and from the beginning of our relationship at that time, for a good year, a year and a half, um, she was, uh, she was wonderful. And, and then things just started to uh, change or things started to reveal themselves. That's, I think is a better way to put it. You mentioned earlier in your testimony that Miss Heard would, would take off your boots when you would get home from work. What, what other types of um, behaviors did you observe in Miss Heard early in the relationship? Um, little things that you would kind of, that it would just, the, you'd question in, in, in the back of your mind, you know, if. If uh, if she wanted to go to bed, I'd say, "Oh, well, I, I, I can't sleep, you know, right now." I, and rather than go and just lay in a bed and stare at the ceiling, I would say, I, "You know, I'll just watch. I'll be out here watching TV or hanging out." And and that was just not acceptable. Just not acceptable. It would uh, it would steer up some some rather unusual um, reactions from her. I, I I I didn't understand why I, as a fifty some year old man, was not allowed to go to sleep when I wanted to, uh, as opposed to when she wanted to. It it started out with little things like that. And again, they, they just, uh, <clears throat> they eventually, they just, I suppose like anything, if they're allowed to continue, then they, then they are allowed to grow. They're allowed to blossom into whatever they're going to become. What were you and Miss Hurd's nicknames for each other? Um, I called her Slim. Why is that? I called her Slim um, because of the, the film that I had given her to watch like about, in terms of stillness was Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart. And uh, I called her Slim and she called me Steve, which was Lauren Bacall's and Humphrey Bogart's nickname, uh, nicknames for each other in the, in the film. That was their names in the film. Um, and it, it, you know, it wasn't, also wasn't lost on me the fact that uh, there was an age difference, and that, uh, um, my God, when when <coughs> when when Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, that's when they met on that film. He was forty-five years old, and she was nineteen, um, and they stayed together until, well, for many years until Bogart passed away. So, yeah, the 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 the, the, the there was a kind of a joke to not joke but, but just uh yeah i acknowledge the the fact that i was the old craggy bogey and she was this um, um beautiful um um creature just this stunning creature 
When did you first meet Ms. Hurd's parents? I first met Ms. Hurd's parents when uh, they, they had come out to Los Angeles, I believe, and uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, I, feel, I feel like that I met them, uh, I think they came to my place, to my, to, to, uh, to my studio, and um, they were two completely opposite ends of, end of the spectrum people page um, was uh, she was an angel she was an angel and uh, and uh, I loved her very much uh, I, I loved her instantly and we had a very good relationship um, her father David was the opposite end of that he was this outrageous kind of almost like a cartoon cowboy you know and he was um, the initial thought I mean my initial kind of definition for David would have been rascally like a rascal you know um, but I I, I I loved, I mean, I grew to love them both very much, uh, as, as well as her, uh, her sister Whitney. And um, yes, it, it felt like I had been welcomed into some sort of family. I had been accepted into this, this family. And um, those relationships stayed solid um, until just a bit after we'd uh, separated. How often did you spend time with Miss Hurd's parents during your relationship with Miss Hurd? Quite a lot. Whether we, I, I used to have a boat um, and we would go, we would take her parents or family and we'd go sail the boat and, um, you know, drop anchor at the island and um, we would spend a week, two weeks, whatever, on the boat, on the island. Um, also, uh, they would come to Los Angeles quite a bit. We also would go to Austin here and there to see them and visit them. Um, every year we would, uh, on their anniversary, um, I had a friend of mine who had a restaurant in Austin, like a very good restaurant in Austin, and uh, I'd, I'd call him up and basically, <laughs> basically set it up so that every year on their anniversary they could just go there and and um, they'd be taken care of and there would be no bill so they could just celebrate and I think one of the things we did was yes we, we would try to order them car so that uh, they, were, they could drink um, no, I, 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 I was very fond of them, very fond of them. Now you mentioned Miss Hurd's sister, Whitney. When did you first meet Whitney? I don't remember exactly when I met Whitney the first time, but I, I've... But I felt when I, when I first met Whitney, there was something in there was something in what I saw of Whitney that was less, much less confident than Amber. Um, much more um, revealing of insecurities. Um, uh, Objection, Your Honor, just foundation. 
what he All saw right. in Whitney. I think if you could answer the question. Okay. You want to ask the question again? I, I, we can move on. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, how would you describe your relationship with Whitney? Great. I mean, it, fantastic. She was, I called her sis. I loved her, you know. I felt, I had always felt something I'd always felt like Whitney had missed out on something. Same objection. All right, we can move on. Okay, thank you. Um, where, where was Whitney living when you first, when you and Miss Heard first started your relationship? She was living with her then boyfriend, Sean Krzyzewski. Was this in the same, where was Ms. Hurd living when you first started your relationship? Uh, Ms. Form, uh, Ms. Ms. Hurd had informed me that she just moved to a new place on Orange Avenue. What city is that in? Los Angeles, sorry, yeah. And was Whitney also living in Los Angeles? Whitney was living in Los Angeles, yes, with, with uh, Sean Krzyzewski and uh, So how often would you see Whitney um, when you and Miss Heard were in a relationship? Oh, a lot. Um, Whitney would uh, Whitney would come over all the time with her boyfriend for dinners and such. Uh, Miss Heard always liked having um, people over, you know, for dinner parties and socially shows, you know, social kind of events at her at her at her place. Have you ever done any drugs with uh, Whitney? Yes. How often would you do that? With Whitney? Yes, with Whitney. Maybe two, two times, three times maybe, twice, three times. Did there come a time when Whitney moved into um, the penthouses that you owned at the Eastern Columbia building? Yes. And, and when was that? I don't remember exactly when it was, but I, I uh, do remember that it was after uh, Rocky uh, Pennington and yes, I believe Josh Drew was there already as well. Um, Whitney, <clears throat> I can't remember why she needed a place, but she uh, needed a place, so we gave her penthouse four to live in. And how long did she live there for? Oh boy, uh, 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 on and off for, uh, I suppose a couple of years. And how much rent did you charge her? Uh, Nothing. Now you said you did drugs a couple times with with Whitney. Um, what what drugs were you doing with Whitney? W Whitney and I had uh, done a, a line or two of cocaine together. When did you start getting introduced to Miss Hurd's friends after you started your relationship with her? Almost immediately, well, in fact, immediately, yeah, immediately. I, I was introduced to uh, the whole gang, you know, Rocky, Io, Brittany Eustace, Whitney, certainly. Um, mm, who else? That, that this all that comes to mind at the moment. No, you, you mentioned Rocky. Uh, who is that specifically? Raquel Pennington. It was Miss Rose's good friend from uh, youth, I suppose. 
And I think you mentioned Brittany Eustace as well. Who was that? Um, Brittany Eustace was uh, uh, just one of the gals. You know, she was one of the gals, and uh, she was quite bubbly and funny and um, real sweet girl, southern southern girl. I haven't seen her um, in. I, I think I think that there I think that something went sideways between Brittany Eustace and the girls because she suddenly just disappeared from the group. And when was that? Probably we were probably uh, a year and a half or two, maybe two no two two years into the relationship three years maybe. And I believe you mentioned someone named Io. Who is that? Um, Io, Io Tillett Wright was a, a friend of Ms. Erd's from New York City who um, was, uh, who, who, who had identified as a, as a, she was born a female if that's the right terminology these days. Born a female, but she was, um, she, she, she had chosen, um, she, at a very young age, she had decided that she w was a, she was a male, and she identified as a male. Um, and I always seemed to be Again, uh, she was she was uh, very intelligent, very literate, um, kind of a go get 'em kind of activist type, and uh, she was writing a book. I remember she was writing a book. Um, I O or he was writing a book, rather, and. Um, I, I I had a house on one of my on, on Sweetser. One of the houses there was empty, and it was in fact a house that I'd set up to to write in. And uh, when she she had no place uh, to stay or, or go, whatever, I, I I called her over and I showed her the house. You know uh, where the desk was and all the things, and, and uh, so she, I said, write your book, you know, write your book here. So I, uh, so she, she did. Did Io end up living in that house or just working there? No, no, I, Io ended up. Uh, no, she, she ended up uh, living in the house for. Somewhere in the neighborhood of a year, I guess. Somewhere about a year. And how much rent did you charge to Io? Nothing. And did there also come a time when um, Rocky moved into the penthouses at the Eastern Columbia building? Uh, Rocky moved into penthouse two. And do you recall when that was? Oh, no. Penthouse one. Sorry. Penthouse one. That was that was not long after uh, Ms. Hurd and I started to uh, begin to dress that place up as our residence. So it wasn't very long after that at all that uh, Rocky and Rocky came. Um, I had already had my friend Isaac, who, who you've met. Um, Isaac Peruch, the painter, he, I had already given him a penthouse two to stay in and, and uh, live in and paint in because he had, he'd just come back from Florida and uh, his mom had passed away and I think he had about $3 in his pocket. So I, I gave him the penthouse and asked him if he had enough paint and so he lived there 
Why did um, Rocky move into the penthouses? Uh, Objection Foundation. Mm. I'll overrule and, Foundation. And hearsay. The question potentially calls for hearsay. Well, I don't, I'll overrule that for the moment. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Depp. Um, what, what, why did, uh, sorry, what was it again? Why did Rocky end up moving into the penthouses? Um, well, she, she, she ended up moving into the penthouses. Um, I don't recall. I, I, I believe it was something to do with just not having a, a, a place. And Amber had asked if I would be okay with, you know, Rocky moving in. And I said, of course, it's a, it, the, the penthouse is empty. I, I, I wasn't in the, um, I wasn't going to be renting them out necessarily anyway, you know, they were for friends to come and stay. I, Penthouse four, in fact, was initially planned out for my sister Christy to have an escape from her three thousand grandchildren and uh, and uh, the amount of workload that she had taken on at the company. How long did Miss Pennington end up staying in the penthouses? Longer than I did. And how much rent did you charge to Miss Pennington? Nothing. Did anyone live with Miss Pennington in the penthouses? Yes, her fiance or boyfriend and fiance Josh Drew. Um, and then at a certain point, uh, I learned that there was uh, a, another female living there. Who I, I wasn't sure who that was. I didn't know who that was. It was it because it was a there was it, there were two bedrooms, and so she had invited a friend to move in, but I I, I met that person very briefly. A while after they had already been living there. I, I, a good yeah, point. I think I this is a good sure. stopping okay. point. That's fine. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is five o'clock, so we'll go ahead and break for the evening. Good morning, Mr. Depp. Good morning. Yesterday, you told us a little bit about the beginning of your relationship with Ms. Hurd. When did Ms. Hurd's behavior towards you begin to change? Um, I believe, as I said yesterday, there was a, a hint of something with the um, having to do with the boots coming off and breaking routine. Um, it, it, her, her attitude, or her, 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 her um, the way that she would um, begin to uh, sp speak to me. Um, think things first things started coming up, and it was I was suddenly just wrong about everything. Um, if uh, I made a statement about something that I had been familiar with, for example, in in my work that I that I'd been uh, chopping away at for a good thirty some years, um, I was suddenly wrong. And um, then beyond that, if you tried to. Um, Explain yourself and correct um, the, the the problem, the, the misunderstanding. It would then uh, begin to heighten um, as uh, Miss Heard was uh, unable to be wrong. It, it just didn't happen. She couldn't be wrong. Um, so these little digs. Um, and uh, there would be, it would commence with sort of demeaning, name calling, uh, 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 
berated, sort of to be made a fool of, um, and those would escalate into uh, a full-scale argument. And in the beginning, as uh, one does, one sticks up for oneself in a in a debate, as it were, or an argument over something to try to prove the point. But when it escalates and then, it's hard to explain, but the, the argument would start here and then it would roll around and become this circular thing of its own. So you get back to the beginning, essentially, of the argument. Now it's heightened even more, but it's still circular and there's no way in or out. You, uh, if, if, if there's a dialogue between two people, um, both people need to speak, but there was no, there was no way to fit a word in. It was, uh, it was uh, a sort of a rapid fire, um, sort of endless uh, parade of, uh, um, insults and uh, you, you know looking at me like I was uh, a fool and I, I just couldn't I, I was I was I was having difficulty in my mind of course and in my heart dealing uh, with that sort of um, barrage um, and part part of that is I, I just I was confused as to the fact that whatever her age was at the time of these various arguments she was mid 20s to late 20s and then to 30s um, I, I couldn't I, I couldn't understand how I had somehow somehow gotten, arrived at where I'd arrived from where I came from in the beginning of my life and worked for 30 plus years um, doing these things. I, I, it was astounding how wrong I was about everything that I've experienced um, within the movie, in, within the film industry or within well, in just life itself. Uh, no, I, 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 I was sort of not allowed to be right, not allowed to have a voice. So at a certain point, when that, when, when what enters your mind is, you start to slowly realize that you are in a relationship with your mother, in a sense. And I know that that sounds perverse and obtuse, but, but the, the fact is that some people search for weaknesses in people. Um, that is to say, sensitivities. Um, and when you've told that person your, your life um, and what you've lived through and what you've been through, just as happens in relationships, um, the more that became uh, ammunition for Miss Hurd to um, to um, either verbally uh, decimate me or or to um, send me into a kind of tailspin of confusion and d depression and um, uh, and and, and, a, and a, well it's 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 not a happy day it's not a happy week it's not a happy month when you're constantly being told how wrong you are about this or that what an idiot you are um, or, 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 or anything, it, it, it just, uh, it, it, 
then it then it increased, increased, and it became an endless. Um, it, it became an endless that endless circle. Like so, as it escalated and continued to escalate, I went straight to what I had learned as a youth, which was to remove myself from the situation so that it couldn't continue because there's only so much your ears can hear and never forget. Um, so I would remove myself from the situation as I'd done as a youth um, as much as possible um, because I'd, I'd, I'd I just I certainly didn't believe that there was any need for these various subjects or arguments to come up and and um, travel the distance that they did so very quickly to ramp up so fast. Um, it was like you were pinned to a wall and had to just listen to it and take it. Um, so I found the only way to find any sort of peace was to uh, try to walk away. If, if uh, she didn't allow me to walk away, um, there were times when um, I, would, I, I would just go and lock myself in. Uh, you know, the bathroom or anywhere that she couldn't get into. Um, and that, that happened uh, constantly uh, over the years. What would happen when the fights would escalate other than going and hiding in the bathroom? I'm sorry? What would happen? Well, if, it, if, if they continued to escalate, um, if I continued to, to try to um, present my, my version or my side of the story, um, when, you, when, you, when you're approached in, in, a, um, in a kind of, um, well, when you're approached with such uh, anger and hatred, it seemed like, pure hatred for me. Um, if I stayed to argue that, eventually I, I was sure that it was going to escalate into violence, and oftentimes it did. Many times it did. And when you say violence, what are you referring to specifically? Um, Miss Heard, in her frustration and in her rage and her anger, she would... Uh, strike out she would it, it could begin with a slap it could begin with a, a shove um it could begin with you know throwing a tv remote at my head it could be uh, throwing a glass of wine in my face um but but, but it, all in all it was a, it was just a um it was a constant uh, there was there was a, a built-in list of of um, as I said m my personal experiences which I gave to Miss Heard those those things were those 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 facts were used against me um, as as weapons. Um, Especially when it, you know, when it came to my kids. Um, so, 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 yeah, I, I, I did. I, there was no need for it. It just, there was no need for it. it, it too many lines were crossed. You could, it was, you couldn't see the lines anymore. You mentioned that um, Ms. Heard would use information you gave her against you like a weapon. Can you explain that a little bit? Um, I mean, I've, I've said this before in 
various interviews, but certainly in life, um, my, if I have one ambition, and amb ambition for me, um, when you equate it with Hollywood, has become a very, has become a, an ugly word in, in a sense, because ambition, ambition means I want to be famous at any cost. I don't care what for, I just want to be famous. That's one thing, that's one uh, part of it. If you have a hunger or a need or a drive to to present your work, um, that that to me is is uh, the, the the way to go about it. Fame has nothing to do with it. So I was more. I mean, basically. The only, the only ambition that I've ever had in my life came, arrived the second that my first child arrived. And in the second, in the instant, which was to be a good parent, to be a, to be a great father, to be the best father I could. And um, there were several occasions where Ms. Heard would um, would tell me what a bad father I was, um, and that I had no idea how to parent. Um, and again, it falls into the same category as before. I couldn't understand how, in f fifty-two years or however old I was at the time how I could be so wrong about everything. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I, one learns along the road. The result is, the result of the road is not important. It's, it's the road that's important because we don't know exactly what any, what's going to happen in 10 years. We don't know. So the road is what I pay attention to and paying attention to Try, trying to spend as much time with my children uh, as possible. Um, even that, even that uh, would, uh, that could send Miss Hurd into a, a monumental tailspin um, where I could, I could hardly ever go and see my kids and spend time with my kids because she, had to have me there at all times for her own needs. So and I, I, that was something that once you realize that that's happening and then there are hassles between the children and her, the situation starts to get a little more grim and a little more dire and um, that I was not uh, prepared to uh, take. I would not hear the words, you're a bad father, you're a terrible father, you're an awful father. Uh, so one can only take so much of that before bits of your brain start to just bits of your brain, bits of your heart begin to, the valve gets shut off because you can't hear it anymore and, and you know that it's not true and you know that it's meant as a web. It's just to, it's to slice you up. It's to bring you down. It's to demean you. It's to bring you into a place where you start to believe that there's something wrong with you. And, um, There's plenty wrong with me. There's plenty wrong with a lot of people. But in all of these uh, situations, my main goal was to retreat. Because I think in life, most important is pick your battles. 
if there's a battle to be fought that it's grave and important, then that must be dealt with. But small insults and kind of teenage sort of high school tactics, um, this bullying, if you will, was um, becoming too much to take. So why did you stay with Ms. Hurd given this type of behavior? That's a very complicated answer. I, I would, I can only say that I, I stayed through all that I'm sure that it's somehow related to my father um, remaining stoic as my mother would beat him to death. Um, I'm sure it had a lot to do with having been in a beautiful, wonderful 14, 15 year relationship with Vanessa, the mother of my children, raising those kids was there there was i had no interest in being a uh, you know the words that they use that i i dislike very much um a celebrity or an entertainer or uh f fame is a strange word because i could never equate it with my self i pumped gas i worked construction i i uh printed t-shirts i Dug in, you know, I had many, many jobs before any of this happened to me. So I've been able to live both sides of that life, of, 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 of life. I, I know the, the very lows and I know the very highs of, um, of where my life has gone. And I, it's not. I don't, I don't, again, it would be pure idiocy for me to sit up here uh, as, a, as an actor who's been very, very fortunate uh, over the years. And I can only say it's, it's luck in the sense that someone hands you the ball in the beginning and you run with it and you run as far as you can before you get tackled. Um, so I, that's, that's um, what I've always done. But what happens is the word, when the word celebrity or, or uh, you, when you are a, what do they call it, a uh, public, a public figure, that, that's what it is, a celebrity or a public figure, um, again, not complaining, but there are things that that are very uncomfortable, and that is to say that at that point anybody can say anything they want to about you, and that's happened to me over thirty six years or more that uh, things can be printed in the newspaper that are utterly false. This is even early on. So this is where that, that privilege, I suppose, that they call the privilege of celebrity, that's, that's where that um, sticks a knife in you. Um, because it's one, of those, uh, that's one of those situations where your arms are too short to box with God, you know. Uh, there are too many of them coming at you. Um, so that yes, uh, I don't I don't know what her motivations were, were, were if they were if there was some species of jealousy or or there was some species of maybe just maybe just hatred I don't know, um, but in any case, the elevation and the escalation of these of these day to day arguments were. Um, 
simply unnecessary. It was, it was not to help the relationship. It did not help the relationship. It wasn't meant to help the relationship. It was meant to feed her um, need for conflict. She has a need for conflict. She has a need for violence. It erupts out of nowhere, and uh, what I learned, the only thing I learned to do with it is exactly what I did as a child. Retreat, just take a step back, which I told her we need to remove ourselves from each other, even for an hour, a day, anything, because this, th th this can't go on. No one can live like this, you know. But why did I stay? I stayed, I suppose, because my father stayed. I suppose because I had been in that relationship with Vanessa, and that was lost, and I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to fail. I wanted to try to make it work. I thought maybe I could help her. I thought maybe I could bring her around. Because the Amber Heard that I knew for the first year, year and a half, was not this, was not this, um, suddenly this um, opponent. It, 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 it wasn't my girl, it was, it was, she had become my opponent, and everything that I did just didn't fit her. Um, it, it wasn't, she didn't accept it. Uh, so I stayed because, of course, I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to, I didn't want to hurt anyone, especially Mrs. Miss Heard. I didn't want to. <clears throat> break her heart. I I remember very well that when my father left and m m my mother, um, Betty Sue, had uh, that first attempt at suicide that I woke up to, and that visual in my head, and that was a direct result of my father's um, leaving um, Ms. Heard had spoken of uh, suicide on a couple of occasions, so th that also becomes a factor. It, it, that's that's also something that that always lives in the back of your brain and uh, you, that you fear. Because when I would leave, sometimes I mean, well, many times when I would try to leave, she would, you know. Stop me at the elevator with the security guards crying, screaming, you know, I can't live without you. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to die. But you had to get out. There were, there were even a couple of times when I did escape and I got to my house, arrived at my house in Switzerland. And then five minutes later, she would arrive in the, in, in the I don't know what car she was driving at the time, but... Um, she would arrive in her nightgown screaming in the parking lot in front of, in, in front of my house, uh, screaming to high heavens. It would be four in the morning, three in the morning. It was ludicrous. It was, it, was, uh, it was out of control. It was uncontrollable. Did there come a time when you and Ms. Hurd started recording your um, arguments? <laughs> Yes, the the. Um, in fact, it was it was. Uh, I was I was the first uh, person of the two of us to to uh, record conversations, and it was for this reason. She would she would. We would have been talking the night before or arguing the night before, and she would say something. There would be these, again, these, these demeaning 
berating insults. There would be these, these, these jabs. There would be anything to make me feel small and, uh, and like nothing. Um, so what I thought was, I'm going to record the conversation. And I told her this. I'm going to record. I'm going to get my phone and I'm going to record our conversation because I want you to hear what you've said to me tomorrow. So that you, because she would deny having said those things. What are you talking about? You know, it was, it was surreal. She had completely denied things she'd said directly to my face in a heated and v volatile way. And she denied it, so I went to her and I said, I'm going to record us. And I did, and we re recorded the uh, conversation, which, uh, when she was on tape, uh, it, the first time, it wouldn't, it, it escalated a bit, but she was, well, it was clear that she was performing for the tape because it was being recorded. So the, that was a, another clue that something was slightly rotten in the state of Denmark, as it were. What did Miss Hurd say to you about you recording the, the conversations between you and her? I mean, initially she said, sure, go ahead. Did that um, ever change? No, then uh, she she um, then she started recording, but um, surreptitious, um, without without saying, without telling me that she was recording something, which is fine, but not so fine, if you if you know what I mean. Um, even in those tapes, I don't, I don't, there's, it never took me to a place where I would, um, go s s switch into some other entity, which is, as she has used the term monster never switched to um, violence. Violence was unnecessary. Um, why would you hit someone to make them agree with you? I, I don't think it works. <laughs> Mr. Depp, you mentioned the term monster and I think we heard about that in the opening mm -hmm. statements what yes. what does the term monster mean to you well the term the, the, the term monster means to me um, you know in the beginning uh, she had used a different um, word to explain the same thing and she she uh, would use the word demon demons that my demons were coming out, or that she had noticed that it was a great change in my attitude or my um, uh, aggressiveness, aggressive nature, or she would, would, would um, say that the demons had come out and they had control of me and that sort of thing. Um, I don't remember exactly how monster came out, but that word stuck and it stayed, well, until this day. Um, what I believe the monster was in Ms. Hurd's mind was her intense, in, Project intense... Your own, um, his belief about what monster meant in Ms. Hurd's mind is not right. relevant, there's no foundation. Let me ask a different right. question. Right. I'll sustain the objection. Go ahead. When you used the term monster, what were you referring to in your conversations with Ms. Hurd? 
When I used the term monster with Ms. Hurd, I was placating. If, I, if, if she had referred to me as being a monster, there was no way that I was going to sit there and go through a 45-minute argument about, you know, you're a monster. No, I'm not. You're a monster. No, I'm not. You're a monster. No, I'm not. It, 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 was, it was an impossibility. So what do you do? You accept her vernacular. You accept what the word that she uses. And then you use that word to, to uh, placate her so that it would at least calm part of the part of the aggression it would it would lessen the uh, attacks you know so explaining the monster was for me um, I mean she, she 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 had told me many times that the monster was was only me when I was uh, using drugs and, and, and alcohol. Um, but it, even when I was uh, stone cold sober off of alcohol um, and uh, substances aside from my meds, the term the monster was still there. When she uh, accused, be, accused me of being uh, high on cocaine or, um, uh, you know, drinking like a, you know, some sort of um, Like drinking like 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 I was a you know some kind of nineteenth century sailor it, it's uh that 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 was the word she clung to to describe but um it was in her mind not mine how did your relationship with Miss Hurd affect your substance use? Well, for example, w when we were on the road, you know, when you're traveling from, uh, if you're on a press tour or if you're making a film and you're staying in a, uh, hotels or this or that, um, I would always have to get a different, or we would always have to book an extra room that I was able to escape to, so I didn't have to lock myself in another bathroom. Um, it breaks you down. It, it, the constant haranguing breaks you down. And, you know, there's a part of you that says, listen, if I'm going to be accused of this, might as well just do it. But, it never exceeded, it, it never, m m my substance abuse or use, the alcohol that I uh, used or drank uh, was, again, purely, it, it's, it's that little boy who didn't want to hear or didn't want to feel the pain of his uh, mother turning him into some kind of um, ball of insecurity and pain. So, yes, uh, I was more inspired by Miss Hurd to reach out for a numbing agent um, 
because of the because of the constant uh, clashes because of the there wasn't there was, I mean maybe a few days here and there but there wasn't a day that you'd wake up and you'd expect something was going to hit the fan and it, pretty much like clockwork it did so yes I I had to have something to distance me and distance my my heart from those verbal uh, attacks. I, I had to have something to to be able to maintain me, and I'm afraid for a while because of because of placation, um, because I didn't want to rock the boat, as it were. Again, you pick your battles. So, placation seemed um, the best route if I was unable to escape her clutches. How, if at all, did Miss Hurd try to support you in abstaining from the drugs and alcohol as she requested? Well, I mean, verbally, uh, and she had been quite clear verbally as, as, as uh, and, and, and pretty bullish and brutish about um, wanting me to, uh, telling me that I needed to stop drinking. But drinking was, basically drinking wine with her um, and I, I, for some, I suppose maybe from youth, I don't know, but I, I've always had um, a pretty high tolerance for alcohol, for especially it's not spirits, you know. Um, I, I, I had a t pretty good tolerance for alcohol substances and things of that nature, uh, but there, there was no, I, I had no, I've worked with, I've worked with therapists, um, drug um, counselors, who have actually said the words to me, because I wanted to know, I wanted to know, Am I, am I an alcoholic? Am I an alcoholic? Or is this just the same thing that I did as a kid when I took my mom's nerve pill? Um, do I have a drinking problem? And it, it essentially came down to this. Do you have a drinking problem, Johnny? Objection. Calls for hearsay. What the doctors told him. I'm not sure he's saying what the doctors told him. I think that's what's about to be testified to. Oh, if you can, if you can make that clear, I guess. Um, let, let me ask you a different question, Mr. Depp. Um, yes. Let's let him object to another one. <laughs> um, how often would Miss Heard drink in your presence? while you were in a relationship? Always. Well, yeah. Uh, Ms. Hurd drank a, she took a shine to a very nice Spanish wine called Vega Cecilia. She and all her friends did. Um, and um, yeah, the wine would, would come out and uh, Miss Heard could uh, very easily drink two bottles of wine per night. Well, not a not a problem. Um, what I found strange was when I did um, did get sober from from the 
uh, while I was off the um, the opiates that I had that I had been addicted to prior prior to a year or so before a couple of years before, um, she asked me if I would stop drinking to save the relationship. Of course, I stopped drinking, and. Um, I always found it odd that in support of me not drinking um, that she might stop drinking, uh, but she did not. She continued and I, I didn't make a big deal about it. In fact, I would open her I would open her wine, I would pour her a glass, and that went on for many, many months, you know, in, in my sobriety. Uh, like I said, I think I, I was sober for around 18 months. Um, then there was a time when I was asked to, and I'd been off, off of alcohol, I'd been off of drugs, everything, uh, except for the med medication, um, that I'm prescribed. Uh, I, w went, I had to go to London to give um, a Lifetime Achievement Award to a, a dear old friend who was an elderly man, great actor called, uh, his name's Christopher Lee. And he was a dear friend. And I was surprised, he was being surprised by my showing up on stage. I'd just flown in from the States and he was, so he was surprised by me arriving uh, to give him this award and Christopher um, came up and accepted the award and we walked they put, brought us backstage to a, a this beautiful library where we uh, the, I was with Christopher and his wife and a, a waiter came up and had three glasses of champagne and Christopher handed one to his wife, he handed one to me, and then he had the other. And uh, there was a photographer there. And the, to you know, the glass came up to toast. And I, and I just, in my head, I thought, it's just champagne, you know, a little bit tink to toast Christopher in his Lifetime Achievement Award. And so I've had half a glass of champagne with Christopher Lee and his wife. Um, after that, immediately after that award ceremony, um, I went to pick up Monsieur and uh, take her to dinner um, at a restaurant. And I told her that I'd had a half a glass of champagne with Christopher. And I thought, listen, it, 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 it's... <laughs> It's not like, you know, you're sitting in a pub guzzling pints of snake bites or Guinness or doing shots of Jägermeister or it, it wasn't even, at that point it wasn't even for need to bury feelings or emotions. It was literally a, a joyous occasion for Christopher and I said to her, I, I I enjoyed it, you know. It gave me the opportunity to enjoy the the actual champagne, the the the, the, the drink, and the, and my appreciation for wine and wine making, and that I've been fascinated with for years and years. And I saw nothing wrong in it. And I said, I'd, I'd like to have a glass of champagne as she was sitting there with a glass of wine. And she, we were in the restaurant and she absolutely lost it and got up and stormed to the ladies room. And I told my security and driver, I said, uh, I think we have to go, I'm gonna have to leave. So we left the restaurant and um, went home 
and the mere suggestion of me sipping a glass of champagne or having one glass or two glasses of wine. She, she wanted apoplectic. She, 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 it was, uh, I was weak. Uh, uh, I was a complete mess. I was an alcoholic. I was, you know, I was going to uh, ruin everything. My, you know, your kids, your kids are not proud of you. They, they can't stand what you're doing to yourself. So at that point, I said to her, "Okay, listen. How about this? You want to, you want to support me not drinking? I've never asked you this before. How about you stop drinking?" How about you get sobriety and share this sobriety with me to support me and help me through this? What did she say to that? No. No. <clears throat> she said no. She said she didn't have a problem. But I, I have never had a physical addiction to alcohol. I don't. How often have you seen Ms. Heard use other illicit drugs in your presence? Several, uh, several times. And what drugs were those? Um, well, uh, she, she was always quite fond of MDMA, which is, which is ecstasy. Um, and uh, mushrooms. Um, and th she had some medications that she, 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 she was on already that were, uh, well, one in particular was quite a high velocity, um, sp speed, if you will, cold, to, well, I don't know if I can say the name, am I allowed to say the name? It doesn't that's, matter. That's not necessary. Um, what, um, how often did you see Ms. Hurd take MDMA? Well, I don't know. A dozen times, uh, 20 times, I, you know, over the course of the years, through, during the course of the years. And what about, um, mushrooms? Um, Mushrooms a little less. Mushrooms probably six, seven times. Mr. Depp, do you recall at the beginning of her opening, uh, Ms. Hurd's counsel mentioned that the first time you supposedly struck Ms. Hurd was in response to a comment about one of your tattoos? Yes, okay. I remember. And what is your response to that? It didn't. It, it didn't happen. I, I've never struck Miss Heard. As I said yesterday, I've never struck Miss Heard. Um, I've never struck a woman in my life. Um, I'm certainly not going to strike a woman if she decides to make fun of a tattoo that I have on my body. That's like going in into someone's journal and picking out uh, things you don't like. She had made mention, uh, I, I, there was no incident of, of, of argument when, she, when the tattoo thing has been, had been brought up many, many times. And I mean, there's really nothing I can do. My, I've always thought of my body as a, as a journal, if you will, to, to, to mark experiences, to mark life experiences. As, you know, for example, when, you're, when my first child was born, I, I had her name tattooed um, on my, over my heart, which is where her little head used to be when I rock her to sleep. Um, I, 
I marked my boy's birth by uh, tattooing myself for him. So um, no one can go back or no one should go back and rewrite their journals. Why would I take such great offense to someone m making fun of a, a, a tattoo uh, on my body? It, uh, it, that, 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 that allegation never made any sense to me whatsoever. Are there any tattoos that you had that Miss Heard had an issue with, to your understanding? Um, well, the, the um, what a, a tattoo that I believe is up here, uh, which used to say uh, Winona forever, who was a former girlfriend, and um, we'd been together for a few years. Um, Winona Ryder and. Uh, when we when when we broke up, um, how do you fix that? <laughs> I did go back and re rewrite my journal to some degree. I I took off the last two letters, um, and had it say "Why No Forever," um, just because I thought it was uh, I thought it was. Again, through pain comes humor. Humor has to come in there at some point into the pain. And that's how you play it out in your mind. So I, I have, uh, I think sometimes abstractly uh, in that sense. So I changed it to why no forever. Um, um, any other tattoos? Um, um, well, she was, she was very encouraging um, in, in, in me getting a, um, a tattoo of, of of her, of her name, or whatever, and uh, I waited a while, and then I, yes, I did it. I got a full tattoo of her, and it uh, ironically wasn't long after that that the um, that everything started going sideways. I, I, I was doing anything I could to bring a smile to her face as opposed to the frown and then the onslaught of whatever um, whatever problems she, 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 she was seeing or experiencing. Um, I, 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 even, I, I would try to wake her up with laughter. Um, you know, singing stupid songs in her ear while she, you know, I, I generally just tried to keep bringing her mood up. Sometimes it worked, many times it didn't. Um, but I, I, I tried and I wanted to try because as I said, I didn't want to fail and at the time, not knowing fully, not understanding fully what I was, if you'll excuse the term, up against. Um, I kept trying, I, I kept trying, but uh, to no avail whatsoever. Okay, it just got worse. Mr. Depp, I'd like to fast forward a little bit to May of 2014. Um, could you please tell the jury what project you were working on in May of 2014? May of 2014? May of 2014, I, I, I'm, I'm, there, was a, there were a number of films that I made in succession. I, I, I can't 
remember if that might have been Pirates. No, I can't. Uh, uh, Mordecai or. Um, May have to, I don't remember what, what can, can you remind me what May of 2014 film was? Were you filming Black Mass in Boston of May of 2014? Ah, yes, okay, yes. yes, excuse me. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. I was, uh, I was filming Black, a film called Black Mass in, in, in Boston. And um, Miss Red had come with me. Um, um, and I had to, for the film, I had to. Uh, there was there, there were very early calls to work because I was I had uh, a number of prosthetics uh, glued to my face and uh, blue contacts, um, so so that I could resemble the the, the actual. It's based on the true story of uh, James Bulger, James Whitey Bulger. And so I had, a, I had to go in quite early to get the prosthetics glued to my face and all that. And uh, work, then you'd work, you know, the whole day. And then at the end of the night, uh, the, uh, they would remove the, the prosthetics, which takes, a, if it took three hours to put them on, it took about an hour to take them off. You know? So on top of a, what could be a, anywhere between a 14, 16, 17 hour day of work, you know, um, what with the application of the, of the makeup and then the taking off of the um, applications. Was Miss Hurd staying with you in Boston during the entire time that you were making that film? Yes. Yes, she was. And who from your staff was in Boston with you during that time? Jerry Judge. Uh, Keenan Wyatt, Stephen Duders. Nathan Holmes, I believe. Um, and I believe Malcolm Connolly was there as well. So I would have um, assistance, sound technician, um, security. I believe, I believe that was it. Mr. Depp, we heard yesterday from Mr. Wyatt about a flight that you and Mr. Wyatt and Ms. Hurd were on from Boston to LA in March, excuse me, May 2014. Do you remember that? Yes. And could you please tell the jury what you remember about that specific flight? Um, I remember that as I was still shooting, filming Black Mass, um, Before I, before I did Black Mass, the film, um, my sister, Christy, um, and I were talking about the, um, the Roxy Codones that I had been, again, you know, that, that was the monkey on my back, uh, that she, she came to me, she told me she'd read this book of uh, Dr. Kipper's book, and uh, I read uh, 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 Dr. Kipper's book, a good majority of it, and um, I agreed that I would uh, do the detox, I would kick the, uh, the opiates, but there was no time to do it before the film. Um, so. Um, when, when the nurse, uh, which was nurse Debbie Lloyd, when she came to Boston, um, she, she had asked me, uh, what is your dosage? What are you, how many of these are you taking per day? And, 
you know, someone who had been under, uh, you know, under the kind of lock and key of, of, of a prescription drug that is highly, uh, highly addictive, I mean, with built-in barbs, that this drug does not want you to stop taking it. Um, she asked me how, I, how many I took per, per day or, or my dosage. And of course, as, as, as any uh, person who is addicted and um, essentially a, uh, uh, a fool to the drug, and you know how important it is because you have felt the sting when it doesn't, when you don't have it. So I'd agreed, I'd agreed to the um, detox and I, she asked me how many I, I took. I told her, obviously, more than I was taking purely because when you're in that frame of mind, the one thing that you do not want to, a situation you don't want to find yourself in, is having no access to the thing that will make you, not high, it will make you, it gets you, you only get better from it. If you start to get the, 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 the shakes and the tremors and the, uh, the, the, you know, you could feel this traveling into your system. You, your 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 um, receptors are out in mass, and your receptors are demanding that drug. If you if you don't give the drug to the to the receptors, you're gonna you will start going into a pretty nasty withdrawal and. Um, and it could, uh, which, you know, could, uh, and has ended in, you know, sort of seizures. You, know, you, could, you, you can go into pretty nasty seizures. So um, I had told Debbie Lloyd uh, more than was necessary so that I could always have one or two in my pocket on the just in case. So I didn't find myself you know, on a plane or anywhere without one in my pocket to stop the, the inevitable uh, body cramps and nausea and, and, and stomach cramps and seizure of the bones and shaking and, and also the, it's quite an emotional ride as well. So, Yes, I, 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 uh, before the flight, um, Amber and her assistant, Savannah McMillan, wanted to be uh, picked up in New York and then have the plane fly to Boston to pick me up to bring us back to Los Angeles. Uh, um, we had spoken the night before. We had argued the night before. Um, she was most definitely um, l looking for a. She was looking for a fight, um, actively searching for a way to instigate a fight with me, um, and I had taken two of these um, opiates, these roxycodones. Um, and I can, I can tell you now, some of you may be very, very well aware of this, opiates um, are extreme downers. So if you have enough opiates in you, you will essentially go on what's called the nod you'll just drop into sleep. So 
I've heard I've heard the words blackout used, and um, there's a grave difference between a blackout um, from 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 um, uh, alcohol abuse, because that is a person who has has has, has inge ingested enough alcohol um, to render them. Um, they, they can still behave and they can still stand and talk and scream and yell and cry and do whatever they do um, and never remember a thing. Um, and generally they're always embarrassed by it. A blackout is a very, very different animal to um, the opiate taking you into dreamland. So when I arrived on the plane, uh, I was not feeling any pain, and I knew that she was ready for a, some kind of brawl, and I, uh, I sat on the plane drawing. I was drawing in my notebook. Um, she would verbally heckle, hassle, accuse, uh, poke, prod physically, you know, poke, poke and prod psychologically, emotionally, it just, and, and, and finally, you know, as was my, uh, the one thing I learned, if you're going to hide someplace from somebody, go straight into the bathroom. So I walked back into the back of the plane, um, I grabbed a pillow and I went into the bathroom, locked the door and lay down on the bathroom floor and went to sleep. And that's where I remained for the rest of the flight. How much, if any, alcohol had you had before you got on the flight? I, I honestly don't recall having any alcohol. I mean, m maybe there was the sort of glass of champagne when you got on the, on the plane or something like that, the initial thing, you know, people order glasses of wine. People also tend to, to uh, have a few drinks before a plane takes off because some people don't like the turbulence and the this and the that, so it's a little bit of a liquid courage, you know. Um, but I, 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 I certainly, after after ingesting two of the roxycodones, um, alcohol was not necessary. So I, 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 I can tell you now that I was not drinking uh, to excess, certainly not. And if I had, I'd probably been in the bathroom hugging porcelain as opposed to sleeping on a pillow. Who else was on that flight that you can recall? Um, I remember Jerry Judge was on the flight. Savannah was on the flight. Ms. Heard. Keenan Wyatt. Stephen Duders. I believe that's it. Or go back to the same home together after that flight? Uh, no, I don't believe. No, we didn't. I don't believe we did. I think she had decided if, if this is the time. Pretty sure. I believe she had decided to check herself into the Chateau Marmont. If the, there are so many of these it's hard it's hard to sort of keep them all straight who would have paid for miss Heard to stay at the chateau my mom um i'm i'm i would have paid for it um if she wanted to go to the chateau marmont i wasn't going to let her pay for it no matter the circumstances i wasn't going to let her pay for it because i knew that that might 
get expensive for for her. So generally, I uh, I would do uh, I would take care of things that are nature. And why did Miss Heard tell you why she was staying at the Chateau Marmont? No. Well, I, I mean, she was she was clearly upset and she was uh, irate um, and uh, I, I can't say that it was a bad idea for her to stay at the Chateau Marmont at that time. I don't know why she went to the Chateau since she still had her apartment on Orange I believe and the penthouse because I, I could have gone to Sweetser, but she went to the Chateau Marmont. Mr. Depp, do you recall why you were flying from Boston to LA in May 2014? I can't remember if it was a break from the film or if I had finished the film. And that was before we went, um, well, before I was supposed to go to the island to uh, to um, the, uh, to detox from from the uh, opiates, I, I think it's. I'm going to to switch gears. Oh, so okay. this is a good time for a break. All right, oh. ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and have our morning recess. Please do not do any outside research and don't talk to anybody about the case. And we'll see you in 15 minutes. Okay. Mr. Depp, who's Dr. Kipper? Uh, Dr. Kipper is a. Um, He's, he's been my doctor uh, since ever since I'd uh, met him in, I believe it was that May of 2014, around, around there in, uh, in Boston. And why were you connected with Dr. Kipper? Um, my sister Christy uh, knew, of course, that I um, had, had been... Um, addicted to the to the uh, the opiates and uh, she was concerned and she brought me his book and uh, talked to me heart to heart and asked me if I would be willing to um, go through the the detox and what was your answer yes of course and you mentioned um, Debbie Lloyd. Can you please explain to the jury who she is? Oh, uh, De Debbie, Debbie Lloyd is a, a, is a, n a nurse um, who my doctor, Dr. Kipper, had assigned to, uh, to my case to, to be the, uh, um, to, to oversee um, the detox and uh, uh, deliver the, the meds, the medications to me that would help with my, uh, with the, the, uh, the effects of withdrawal that, that, uh, that one goes through the, uh, to, to essentially try and knock you out so that you don't go through, um, the, the nastiness of the, uh, affair. Did Miss uh, Did Miss Lloyd stay on after the detox process as your nurse? Yes, she did. And when you were under Doctor Kipper's care, how often did you see Miss Lloyd? Um, on location every day. Um, yes, on location every day. Um, even when uh, after. Um, a year or two, I would, I would, I was still seeing her at least on a bi-weekly basis, for two to three times a week. When did you start the detox process that you mentioned? I know, I know that it's. 
believe it was around, it was in August, July or August of uh, 2015, 14, I cannot remember the year, 14, I guess. And where, were, where did you do this detox process? Um, uh, we, we, we did the, we, 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 the detox process uh, um, happened on, I have a, a place in the Bahamas. Um, I'm never comfortable saying this, but it, it's an island. <laughs> it's a very strange thing to say. Um, but I thought that that would be the best place, the most private um, place where there were no um, worries of um, paparazzi or any of that. So it was, it was a place where I could literally be the only place where I can have actual uh, anonymity. So I thought that would be the best place to, to do it. Who came with you down to the island for the detox? Um, Debbie, Nurse Debbie Lloyd uh, traveled w with me on, uh, on the plane. Um, uh, Ms. Hurd. And I, I, believe, I, believe that was, I believe that was it. Um, on the plane to, to go to the island for the detox. I was not bringing um, security. I was not bringing assistance. Um, in, in, in fact, initially, my sister Christy uh, was, was going to uh, go there um, to help Ms. Lloyd and the doctor through the detox, which made perfect sense since that the whole thing had um, been born out of her uh, desire for me to get clean. Um, so initially, it was supposed to be Christy coming um, in place of Ms. Hurd. I there was a there was a great part of me that was. Uh, very uncomfortable with Ms. Hurd coming along for that um, detox uh, because as, as things could fluctuate very rapidly in our relationship, um, I, I was... I was wary that, that those things would come up during what needed to be a very straight um, detoxification of, of, of these substances. And I was well aware that it was not going to be pleasant. I, I was well aware that, that I was going to go through quite a bit of uh, uh, physical changes, physical um, yes, I, 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 I was I was afraid that it would be too much for her, and I also felt that she might be too much for me at the time. So then, why did Miss Hurd come down to the island with you during the detox process? Um, she insisted, and she switched places with uh, Christy. Could you please describe for the jury, Mr. Depp, what it feels like to go through a detox from, from opioids? Um, I would say the best, way, the best way to describe it is it, it, it feels like you're you're, it feels like the inside of you, the very inside of you, is trying to escape the body. So it's um, 
it becomes obviously very physical and so therefore you'll go into a withdrawal would would mean that you you would go into um, you'd have immense cramps in your stomach your muscles would seize you my body would shake um, the pain is uh, like nothing I've ever experienced before um, part of it was so the, the best way to explain it for example there was a situation that uh, when we were on the island and I was going through the detox uh, and it was hitting pretty hard at that point um, and Ms. Hurd had made a deal with um, nurse Debbie and Dr. Kipper to, to stay at their end of the island and that she would administer the drugs to me administer the medications that, 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 that I needed to not go into um, the, for lack of a better word, the, 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 these intense, uh, sharp, painful heebie-jeebies. Uh, um, and there was a moment when I could feel my body starting to tense and I could feel the withdrawals coming on and they come on quick and uh, they're not uh, they're not discreet um, they go straight for uh, the jugular I mean the, 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 like I said when when your receptors are in full bloom and begging for the the, the, the substance, the drug, the, the, the opiates that, they, that the, my body had become used to, the, the, these um, receptors that were being fed by. Um, there was a moment when uh, it, was, it, it was coming on very fast and I, and I, 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 I was sitting on a couch in, in the little house that we all saw on the island Ms. Heard was at the, uh, she was in the sort of kitchen area and she was chopping vegetables, I remember. And I, 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 can't, I think it was around 2.30 in the afternoon and the effects of the withdrawals were really coming on. And I said to, um, I said to Ms. Heard, uh, I'm gonna need the meds now. And she said, uh, she looked at the clock and she said, it's not time. And I said, no, 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 you don't, you don't understand. This is, this is not about clocks and watches and things. I'm going, I'm going into uh, the ship and it was visible. And uh, I hate, I hate to have, I hate saying this. I hate to have to admit this, but that was, uh, I believe that was about the lowest point in my life. That was the lowest I'd ever felt as a, as a human being because I had to say, please, please, may I have the meds? Because it, it, it's really kicking in and she was adamant. No, nope, it's not time, it's not time. So in, in explaining how these, these uh, withdrawals start to take over your body, when I was <laughs> begging at that point, for the meds, I found that I had sort of rolled off the couch and I was sitting on the floor crying. I mean, 
tears <laughs> streaming down my face, begging another human being to please, please give me the meds that will take this away. And she would not. She was adamant that, nope, it's not time, four o'clock. So the only thing that one can do in that situation is you have to trick the body. You have to, you have to manipulate your body out away from those, well, you have to trick the body to get away from the receptors. So the only thing that one can do is you go straight to uh, the shower and um, you put it on scalding water and you stand underneath a scalding shower and essentially you're burning the top, you know, your skin is burning from the heat of the water. And what that would do is it would trick the nervous, the nerves away from the receptors because they had, now they had an immediate problem that needed to be dealt with the nerves. So they, so what it does is the scalding shower would, 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 would reverse those n nerve endings and they would go up to the top of the skin uh, because there was a problem there. So that's, that's, how you, that's how I would be able to bypass um, those, those withdrawal symptoms at times. It, it doesn't fully take them away, but, but what it does is it tricks your body into, into thinking that there's something going horribly wrong on top, so it keeps them away from the receptors. Um, and um, after that, I had a conversation with Nurse Debbie and with Dr. Kipper, and I said, uh, <clears throat> I don't believe I told them that she had uh, denied me the meds when I was in need, and uh, then I told them that I don't think that this is going to work here anymore. I think we have to leave the island, and I need to be, we, we, she can't be with me while I'm going through the rest of this detoxification. So I told, I told them we should leave the island. Um, I told, I asked them if, uh, they under, if they understood what I was doing, and they did. So we went back to Los Angeles, and then I asked Ms. Hurd if she would please uh, allow me five days, seven days, whatever it took to get out of, to get done with, finished with the rest of this, 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 this horrific detox and the pain. Did Ms. Hurd give you that time? <laughs> she did, reluctantly, yes. I was, uh, I was immediately accused of throwing her out. I was accused of um, abandoning her. Um, I was accused of not appreciating all that she had done to get me to this point where I was, which was kind of an interesting argument for me. Uh, I begged her, please, can I, can I get a place at the Beverly Hills Hotel? I'll get you and your friends a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel where you can all stay together and have a grand old flag. You can have fun, you can do whatever you want, and you don't have to sit around Mr. Uh, Shaky. And uh, she wasn't happy about it, but uh, I, it was very necessary. So I, she did eventually um, leave for about five, five days or so, and I sat in a, uh, after a few days, I sat in a, 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 a metal chair with one song on the, uh, one song on a loop 
that I could focus on the lyrics and the, the, the power of the song um, to help me get through it. And uh, even, even once this, the, in, the, de, the, the, the uh, effects, you, you know, started to go away, that is the pain, I was still in this, something strange that happens, you feel, you feel electricity in your body. You, you, you feel this electric, um, very foreign, um, and you're just sitting, sitting there like going through it. And I didn't understand what the electricity was um, until probably, and this lasted for the electricity, that, that, that feeling lasted for a month, two months. And I finally realized at a certain point what that electricity was. And um, I was feeling, is that's what it was. I was actually feeling um, without the aid of the drug, without the aid of any drugs. I, I, I mean, I had I had refused with Dr. Kipper and Nurse Debbie and Amber at the table before she left uh, for the hotel with her friends. I, I had r refused to continue taking um, the phenobarbital and the lithium. Uh, because to me it was just another drug in the way. It, it seemed like it was just another hurdle to get over. And I would rather just get it out of my system now and, and move forward. Maybe I wouldn't have had the electricity. Maybe I wouldn't have felt as quickly, but um, I, didn't, I didn't want to take phenobarbital and lithium and Seroquel and Neurontin and all these other things. Uh, and the worst of the two, I believed, were, were the, were the uh, phenobarbital and the lithium. So I just, I went through uh, that. Lily Rose did not come to the wedding. Uh, she and Miss Heard were not um, on particularly great terms uh, for several reasons. Um, there were a number of, number of Ms. Heard's friends and her family. Um, so I, I'd say all in all, maybe there were, it seems like there could have been no more than 20 people, 25 people maybe. Was there any alcohol served at the wedding? Yes, there was alcohol served at the wedding. There was champagne, there was all the accoutrements and then um <clears throat> yes and was anyone ingesting any illegal drugs at the wedding yes and who was who was doing that well there was a there was a schedule that was uh, written out and printed out and sent out um so that everyone would know exactly the time that everything would happen. Um, and on that, on that sheet, um, the schedule, it, it would, it, there was um, uh, like some kind of rehearsal type thing. There was also um, um, there was a, there was a great dilemma in who was going to be who. That's where the um, argument between uh, Ms. Pennington and uh, Io Tillett Wright. Uh, Mr. Depp, who, who did you observe taking drugs at the wedding? Um, a number of people uh, were taking um, MDMA. As I said, the, the, the list, there was a, after the wedding, there was a, a, a 
it was like dinner dancing and drugs um, on the on on the schedule uh, that uh, came from Miss Heard and Miss Pennington. Um, so Amber. Um, Raquel, a um, couple of friends of mine, um, Savannah, her assistant, um, Till it right. All of her, all of her, uh, all of her gang were all um, uh, partaking in the of the MDMA. What if any MDMA did? What if any drugs did you take that day? Again, to, to be honest with you, um, I was, I was, I mean, I don't know how much MDMA they had but uh, for me that was um, f for me to have taken MDMA would have been a waste of the drug if you if you understand what I mean it would have been essentially taking someone else's high because I it wouldn't if it wouldn't have an effect on me so did. how many, how much, how many drugs did you actually take that day? The day of our wedding? Yes. Um, I smoked marijuana and, um, I don't remember drinking. I don't, I don't remember if I, I, that I was drinking then. This was right. This was, this was, this was right before she was going to London to do, I believe, London Fields. And I was going off to uh, Australia to do Pirates 5. Um, I'm pretty positive at that point I wasn't... Uh, uh, partaking of alcohol. Um, my drug of choice is, uh, or was, and it is marijuana. Uh, um, it's, that's all I, that was fine for me. Um, so, so dipping into a, a, a little tiny baggie of, you know, licking your finger and dipping into a little tiny communal bag of MDMA. It, it wasn't gonna, it was pointless for me. When you and Miss Heard got married, did you have a prenuptial agreement in place? No, we did not, no. And why not? Um, they're always, seemed to be some reason or another why she wouldn't, either wouldn't discuss it or if we did discuss it, it became an issue that would turn into a, um, it would springboard into unpleasantness and then arguments. Um, and, and then it was also too late at a certain point, it was just too late. So then the idea of a post-nup agreement was brought up to Miss Heard, and that was in Australia. That was that was the beginning of uh, the Australian well, let's, let's fight. Talk, let's talk about Australia then. Um, but first of all, why were you in Australia? I was, I was working on Pirates of the Caribbean 5. And who from your team was with you in Australia? 
uh, Jerry Judge, Malcolm Connolly, uh, Nathan Holmes, Stephen Duders, Keenan Wyatt, I believe that was it. Oh, uh, and, and yeah, yeah, no, that's it. Was Miss Lloyd in Australia with you as well? Oh, yes, yes, sorry, yes. Miss Lloyd, yes, Miss Lloyd traveled to Australia with us. And did Dr. Kipper come down to Australia at any point? Yeah, he, he, Dr. Kipper down, came down uh, a bit later. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Wyatt testified yesterday that he observed you have a meeting with Sean Bailey in, in Australia. Do you remember that? Yes. And could you please tell the jury who Sean Bailey is? Sean Bailey at that time was, I believe he was the, I believe he was the number three, uh, the number three man at Disney in terms of hierarchy. He was a uh, upper echelon Disney. So he was under Bob Iger um, and initially under Dick Cook, who was removed from Disney um, for some reason. So yes, he, he's, uh, he was number three man at Disney. And why were you having a discussion with Mr. Bailey? Um, the discussions that I would, uh, was having with Mr. Bailey, with, with Sean Bailey were um, they had to do with, well, as, as I think we've established, you know, I have uh, always, from the beginning of those, this, that series of films, I, w I, I had always rewritten um, my, my character's words and jokes, if you will, um, and situational comedy and things that I would add. And uh, Mr. Bailey was very complimentary about some of the things that I'd done. He'd, uh, you know, he, he'd come over to me laughing after Objection. a take. Objection calls for hearsay. Your Honor, this is just discussing generally what they were talking about. No, he was getting specific. I'll sustain that if you want to continue. That's fine. Mr. Depp, was Miss Hurd in Australia with you? She came a little later, yes. Do you recall when she came down? I don't recall. Oh, oh, oh well. No, I do recall. It was March. It was March. And what happened when Miss Hurd came to visit you in Australia? Um. Ms. Hurd was upset because, uh, 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 as I stated earlier, as it was too late for a prenup agreement, there, there was a uh, discussion of post-nup agreement. And I had called my lawyer at the time and asked him if, if he could have one of his, uh, one of his lawyers sit down with Ms. Hurd and, and give her a, a basic rundown of what a post-nuptial agreement uh, meant. And, and they sh I was told that they showed Objection. her. Objection, hearsay. Your Honor, this is what a, 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 something he asked an attorney. It's not a, a statement of fact that's being offered for its truth. Yeah, I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Next question. What did Ms. Hurd tell you she was upset about when she arrived in Australia? Ms. Hurd told me that the attorney that she met with was um, rude and dismissive and all she was being shown was a uh, an example of a, a postnuptial agreement, 
Ms. Sir then stated to me that she was very upset. She stated to me that um, that she, she, what she had said was, she said to the lawyer, the woman, that this um, Johnny can't, he, he must not, he, he doesn't know about this. He, he's never seen, he doesn't know that this is what this is. He, no way he would agree to this. Um, and what Ms. Heard then expressed to me was that the lawyer, the woman, had laughed at her and said, oh, he knows. Yes, he knows everything. Um, which sent her into a, a tailspin. So by the time she arrived in Australia, that was uh, sunk very deep into her her psyche. Um, I mean, so much so that what really what really surprised me was that she kept saying, "I'm not even in your will. I'm not even in your will." I thought that was an odd thing to say. Um, especially since I, I, I don't think anybody had had time to change wills or anything of that nature. Um, so th th those things just didn't, it, it felt uh, wrong. And, and she could not let go of the fact that uh, I was in on this uh, post nup agreement and that I was trying to trick her into uh, essentially getting nothing if uh, if something were to happen. And how did you respond to Ms. Hurd? I said, I just told her those were not my intentions, uh, it, you know. And at a, a certain point, you don't know what to do. I mean, it's, it's a, the person is telling you, she's telling you, you don't trust me, you don't trust me, you don't trust me, and um, I, I can't speak about legal documents. I can't speak legalese. I can't explain to her these things. All I could do was try to calm her down and say that I was not out to screw her over or, or, or put her in a position that was, uh, was uncomfortable. Did that work? These were stock, these normal things to do. It did not work, no. It escalated and escalated and to, turned into uh, madness, chaos, can you please violence. Can you please describe that chaos and violence? Yes, she, 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 she was irate. She, she, she was irate and she was possessed. Uh, and when I tried to remove myself as I normally would from a situation, and that is to say, you know, as she's hammering me with, with uh, this sort of brutal, brutal words and, and uh, you know, you know, I, I don't, pardon my language, but I remember that uh, it wasn't nice sort of being called an ass kisser to lawyers or or uh, or uh, a pussy um, that didn't fight for her or stand up for her. Um, um, I, again, tried to remove myself from the situation, um, but to no avail, as I, I, I literally, the house that they had rented for me in Australia. It was quite a large place. It was quite a bit of a labyrinth, you know, and a lot of rooms, a lot of extra rooms. So I would go to, well, 
I'll, I'll just cut to the chase. I, I think that I ended up locking myself in about at, le at least nine bedrooms, bathrooms that day um, as she was banging on the doors and screaming obscenities and wanting to uh, have a physical altercation. So how did it come to be that your finger became injured? There was at one point where I'd, I'd stayed in one of the, you know, I'm sitting on a bathroom floor, door locked, she's banging away, banging away, screaming, blah, 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 and then suddenly she stopped and I could hear her walk away. I could hear her sort of receding into the distance, if you will, and I, 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 you know, yes, I, so, 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 yes, it became very emotional because I, you can't win for losing. There was nothing I could do to, to make her understand that I had, if that lawyer had in fact done that, and I did call my lawyer uh, at the time, Jake Bloom, and I had him get these people on the phone. And I, uh, I'm ashamed to say that I had taken, at that point when, we were, when I was on the phone with him, I had taken Miss Hurd's words to heart and um, and I laid out a ration of of um, very uh, uh, I was very upset that she was pushed to that limit because I had believed it um, and uh, in fact none of it had happened so. Uh, It was all getting too crazy. And again, I had been sober for many, many months from alcohol and substances, aside from the marijuana. Um, and I got, I left the place, the, the room that I was hiding in, or not hiding, locked myself into. And I went downstairs in the house there was been downstairs in the house as soon as you walk in the house you can go upstairs or downstairs from downstairs there was a sort of a wreck wreck area pool table and such and uh, and there was a uh, bar and uh, I was uh, um, I was a mess I was a wreck I was shaking and I just didn't understand why all this was happening. So I went behind the bar, I grabbed a bottle of vodka that was there and a shot glass and sat at the bar. She was nowhere around. And I poured myself two or three stiff shots of, uh, of the vodka, first taste of alcohol I'd had in a long time. and. Um, then she came down to the bar and found me there. And of course started screaming, oh, you're drinking again, eh? the monster and all that. Um, so she reached, she, she, she walked up to me and reached and grabbed the, the bottle of vodka. And then just uh, kind of stood back and then hurled it at me. And, and it, it, uh, it just went <laughs> right past my head and smashed behind me. Uh, so I stood up and I walked behind the bar and there was a larger bottle of vodka, the kind with the handle, you know, on it. I grabbed that and I went and I sat in my seat again. I opened the bottle and I poured myself a shot and drank it. 
Mizrahi was flinging insults uh, left, right, and center, and she then grabbed that bottle. And, uh, and threw that at me. Um, and the way that the, the way that the bar was sit situated and w w where Miss Heard was. So if, 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 if I could show you, so if, if, if this is the bar where the glass was, and the bottles, if this was the bar and I'm sitting here like this, she would grab the bottle and she would go there, she went there. And so I was leaning like this in the chair, looking at her, first bottle went, then got the other bottle shot, takes the second bottle, which was the larger one. I'm in this position again. And my my hand is on the edge of the the bar like like that, you know, leaning over the fingers like that. And uh, she threw the large bottle, and it made contact and shattered uh, everywhere. And I, I honestly didn't I didn't feel the pain at first at all. I felt no pain whatsoever. What I felt was, um, I felt heat. I felt heat and I felt um, as if something were dripping down my hand, you know. Um, and then I looked down and realized that the, the, the tip of my finger had been severed and uh, I was looking directly at my bones sticking out and uh, the 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 meaty portion of your the inside of your finger the, um, and it was it, blood was just uh, pouring out and at that point I, I I I think that I went into some sort of I, I don't know what a nervous breakdown feels like but that's probably the closest that I've ever been I didn't nothing made sense and I knew in my mind and in my heart, this is this is not life. This is not life. <laughs> no one should have to go through this. And and as I said, this this feeling of nervous being in a, in the middle of some sort of nervous breakdown. I started to write with my blood in my own blood on the on the walls um, little reminders from our past that essentially represented lies that she had told me and lies that I had caught her in um, and and, uh, and, and then I did it the next thing, uh, you know, I, amongst all the madness, I, 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 I would again hide in the bathroom or wherever, and I texted Dr. Kipper and I said, you might want to come over, uh, you know, I've cut my finger off here. Which finger was, was cut, Mr. Depp? Um, it's the, the middle, it's the funny looking one. <laughs> it's the middle finger. Here, you can see the, well, you can see all the, the sort of, the, the, from the initial wound, the, this, this, all these bones up here were crushed 
and it looked like a it looked like Vesuvius, you know. And um, so this 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 part of my finger now is so that because of not having use of the tip here, uh, this is um, basically uh, arthritis that kicks into the joint once that once that. Uh, upper part of the finger is mangled. So is that the right middle finger? Right middle, yes. And is that your dominant hand? Uh, yes, it is, yes. Mr. Depp, after Ms. Hurd threw the vodka bottle at you and severed your finger, um, what, if anything, did she say when she saw the injury? I don't recall anything, but just uh, it was almost like white noise, or just someone yelling. Or just a, it was just a high-pitched, constant um, attack of, of insults. Of it was just jumbled words to me in a, in a very high frequency, and I I, I I I was in a bit of shock, you know. I was in shock. <laughs> you mentioned that you reached out to Dr. Kipper. Did you receive medical attention after that? Yes. Um, uh, Jerry Judge, Malcolm Connolly, I believe Debbie Lloyd was there. Yes, Debbie Lloyd was there. Um, ben King had arrived as well. Who is Ben King? Uh, ben King uh, was, he, he's, he's essentially, he's a house, so, so sort of a, an estate manager, and he, I we worked together in London a, a few times, and uh, uh, he's a wonderful guy, so I brought, brought uh, Ben along to Australia to, to manage everything. He's very, he's very, very good and very nice. Um, and then there was also a, oh, yeah, I mentioned Malcolm and Jerry. Yeah, they were there as well. Which, if any, of the medical professionals that you saw that day, did you tell what happened to your finger? I, when Malcolm and, um, Dr. Kipper, when, when they took me to, first first we went to Malcolm's uh, uh, apartment where he was staying while we were shooting the film uh, and tried to clean uh, my hand because I had worked the day before and uh, obviously when you're playing a pirate, Captain Jack or whatever, they, you're, you're covered, you're, they paint with on with alcohol, um, with rubbing alcohol, they paint dirt all into your hands and into your face and everything. So they were they were worried about getting my finger clean. So they tried doing that at Malcolm's, and then Chipper said, "No, we got to get to emergency room, and we got to get hold of the tip of his finger." So we went to the emergency room. Um, the doctor asked me what happened, <clears throat> and uh, I lied to him. I said that I had uh, smashed it in, um, in, in these large accordion doors that it got caught in the accordion doors. Why would know. you lie about that? I lied because I, I did not... I didn't feel, I, I didn't want to disclose that it was, what it was. I, I didn't want to disclose that it had been, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to disclose that it had been misheard, that it had thrown the, thrown a vodka bottle at my, at me and then took my finger off. I didn't want to get her in trouble. I didn't want to, 
I try to uh, just keep things as copacetic and as as easy as possible for everyone. I, I did I did not want to put her name in that in that mix. Did you tell Dr. Kipper what had actually happened to your finger? Yes. After you returned from the hospital, where did you go? I went to Malcolm Connolly's um, apartment uh, and uh, slept on his couch. And to the extent that you know, where was Ms. Heard during this time? Um, Ms. Heard uh, was, I, I wasn't there, but I, I had a, it was clear that she had to, uh, she needed to leave. And uh, I'd asked them to get her on a flight from Melbourne or Sydney or wherever back to Los Angeles. Why did you ask for that? I, I didn't want to see her. I, I didn't, I didn't want to see her. I didn't want to have any more arguments. I was, uh, for all intents and purposes, I was just done. Mr. Depp, I'd like to show you a picture. If we could please pull up plaintiff's exhibit 145. <clears throat> Yes. What is this a picture of? That is, um, that's me in the emergency room. Uh, I see, um, I see a detail that I forgot, I'd forgotten, which is the, the Ms. Rudd had pulled, taken my cigarette from the ashtray and uh, stomped it out in my face here. Do you, you mark you, on the screen where you see that? Um, it's right above that green dot. And do you know who took that, this picture? I do not know. Uh, can we please publish this to the jury? Do you want to enter into evidence? Yes, please. The objection? No, All right. 145 in evidence, you can publish to the jury. And so, Mr. Depp, now that the jury can see the photograph, can you again explain um, what that green dot is identifying? Um, just above the, well, just above the green, the green dot is a, uh, uh, a, a, a wound uh, from uh, Ms. Hurd taking my cigarette and, and um, at, this is after the finger had gone away um, and she stubbed it out in my, in, in, in my face, in, on, on my cheek. So uh, that's the... Um, result of that. If we could please take this um, down and I'd like to show you Mr. Depp um, plaintiff's exhibit 144. Yep. It's um what is this a picture of, Mr. Depp? The, the remains of my finger. And was this taken shortly after you were injured? 
I, I, I believe this was taken at the uh, at the emergency room, I'd imagine. Um, I'd move to add this into evidence, but I'd like to also warn the jury and the people in the right. audience that this is a very graphic picture. All right. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right. 144. We can take this down. Thank you. Mr. Depp, how long after your finger was injured did you return to L.A.? Um, after the emergency room, um, the following day, uh, I was sent to a, they found a, a, a surgeon uh, in, uh, in Australia. Um, so that I could go, they wanted me to take have X-rays taken and and uh, all that. Uh, so I, we went to that doctor, the finger surgeon, um, and uh, he asked me what happened to my finger, and I again lied. And I stuck to the story that uh, it was smashed in an accordion, a large accordion door. And he looked at me as if I were uh, lying. And the next thing I heard was, sir, that is a wound of velocity. And... Um, your Honor, this is a communication in the context of medical treatment. I'll sustain the objection. Moving on. Uh, so, so, Mr. Depp, th this was a surgeon you saw in Australia? Yes. Um, when did you return to Los Angeles after seeing that surgeon? I, b I believe it was probably the next day um, where might have been Kipper, someone who who had hooked me up with a, a, a wonderful, sir, a great uh, expert in um, reconstruction of uh, you know hand, uh, hands, fingers, digits, whatever. Uh, so I went to see the surgeon, and um, we prepped for surgery. Uh, you know, pretty quickly. And what type of surgery did you have on your finger? Um, the, the majority of th this was all uh, missing. Um, and essentially to some degree hollowed out, if you will, because the bone had shattered. And um, then there was the bone that was sticking out down there. Um, so he had to take, take, uh, do a skin graft from, from this part of my hand uh, and graft it um, onto my finger uh, to, 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 uh, to give me a finger again. Anything else that was done to your finger to stabilize it? Um, I, I don't think it was initially that they put the pin in. I think the pin feels like the pin came later. I can't, I, I'm not sure, but um, you just, uh, I had to go after the surgery, um, it was bandaged up, and they, you know they give you all kinds of things on what to do, what not to do, keep it elevated, or this or that. And uh, I just uh, 
walked away with a very large uh, middle finger. <laughs> it was all wrapped up to like this and then, you know, uh, Medicaid, they've, they've given me shots in there and such. How long did you wear that bandage that you just described? Well, the, ba the bandage was f from the time of the surgery all the way through the remainder of finishing parts of the Caribbean, which was, uh, I think I finished, I I the injury took place in March, finished parts of the Caribbean 5, I believe, in August, beginning of August, end of July. So there was a bandage on it the whole time. What I had to do was um, wear, b b because of, um, there's a special effects um, a trick that they had planned. Basically, the, whatever bandage I had on, as long as they could, they would put more, uh, little green dots, for example, on the, on the, splint and the finger and all that and the bandages so that in post-production they could use what's called uh, com computer generated imagery cgi to to erase the bandage uh, and put a replace it with a normal finger um, that's how we finished the film If we could please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 61. <clears throat> and if we could scroll to the second picture or third. Can you keep going one more, please? Uh, another. Sorry, this is a series of pictures, and to spare everyone, I don't think I'll show you the um, the immediate injury again. This is right one right here. Thank you, um, Mr. Depp. Do you recognize this picture? Yes, I do. And what's reflected in this picture? Uh, this was taken in the uh, surgeon's office. Um, where I'd go in, well, I had to go in every couple of few days to have it checked out um, for infections and such. Uh, and this, this so the, the, the finger, finger, non-finger, was uh, wrapped quite heavily and there was this medicated uh, Kind of greasy medicated thing on, on top of the wound itself um, and this I believe seems like when the pin was in here uh, and the, the wrapping is uh, the bandage is uh, well I had my choice you know and uh, I thought well may as well take the kitty bandages you know dinosaurs and hearts and Unicorns, <laughs> as Absolutely. I said, you know, at uh, least at least to uh, have some humor uh, to deflect the pain. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to move um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 61 into evidence. Do you want the whole exhibit or just this picture? Um, if we could publish uh, the whole exhibit. You want the whole picture, yeah. the whole exhibit. Any, any objection to 61? No, Your Honor. All right, 61, but you just want to publish this part of 61. Yes. Okay, thanks. So how long after the, your injury was this picture taken? After the initial injury? Yes. I'd say no, no, no more than, it would seem to me, no more than five days a week. Okay. And how long was, was this bandage on your hand for? Uh, well, I was wearing bandages all the way up until I finished the film and then 
um, yeah, through through up through August for sure, and then beyond. I, I had to keep it. Uh, I had to keep it covered. I had to keep it protected. Do you recall how long after the injury that the excuse me, how long after the surgery the pins were removed from your finger? I would say maybe I think it was about two or three days because I remember that there was maybe more, but I just remember that the pain seemed to be getting worse and worse as Debbie would rate it, you know, from a, is this an eight out of 10? Is this a three out of 10? That kind of thing. Um, at a certain point it, 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 it became uh, kind of a 12 out of 10 because it, it felt, it felt hot, very, very, very hot. And it felt, uh, there was there it was there was throbbing it was like a th it was throbbing and the pin in there uh, it was like i could feel the pin in there so i i i we called the surgeon i called the surgeon told him actually i think it might have been debbie lloyd actually that called but but uh, i knew i had to see the surgeon again cuz something felt very wrong and i went there and he removed all the bandages and he found that um, that my finger was indeed infected uh, and that I had uh, contracted uh, MRSA, uh, MRSA, um, which is like a, I believe it's like the flesh-eating disease or something. It, it, it was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty grotesque sight um after that with the with the pin in and, and what they had to do to save it mr depp um while your finger was injured and in healing did you ever take any opiates during that time no ma'am no 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 more um, Your Honor, I was, I'm about to switch gears, so if right. it makes we sense to that. take our lunch break. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take our, our lunch break. <clears throat> Mr. Depp, could you please explain to the jury what's reflected in this photograph? Um, I believe that's, uh, well, it's definitely me. Um, uh, after uh, receiving a... Uh, Kind of a a, a, a roundhouse um, punch um, from Miss Hurd. I believe that this is uh, it's March. Uh, I believe that this is from w w what's been called a staircase incident. Am I correct? Am I right? So, if do you, you said you think this is from March of two thousand fifteen. Um, I'm just looking at the top. Okay. Do you remember who took this photograph? Uh, Mr. Bett, Sean Bett. And relative to when you had injured your finger, when was this photograph taken? Sorry? Relative to when you had injured your finger in Australia, when was this photograph taken? Uh, the... The injury to my finger was sustained uh, uh, I believe it was a couple of weeks or so before this because I was we were back in <clears throat> Los Angeles for the surgery and rehabilitation of the uh, digit so I know you can't see your hand in this photograph but what was what would your hand have been like given its injury at this date um, well, it, it was, it was still a very, um, it was a very fresh wound, um, when that amount of, um, when 
the tip of your, when your finger is uh, severed, um, that's not going to heal up for a very long time. And uh, so my finger was still, it was still a very fresh wound. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that, that uh, the, the, this might have been around the time of the pin. In, uh, the, the pin that was, uh, that was uh, put into my finger to keep it together, I guess. And what type of cast would you have had on at this time? It, it, it wasn't a cast per se, as it was, a, it was, a, it was bandaging. Um, uh, when the when the when the bandage was out to sort of here, um, that was extra padding for the uh, for the tip of the finger uh, protection and. And also because of the, the, the pin that was in there. Um, so, as I'd said before, there were, there were, when D Nurse Debbie would ask, you know, give me, you know, on, on a scale of one to ten, your pain, uh, when the fingers started to feel differently and hurt a lot more and it became like a 12 out of 10 pain uh, that, that that was uh, uh, yes that was right around then and and the reason for that was because of the the infection the MRSA had already uh, been um, working its way for a number of days Mr. Depp, could you please explain to the jury the circumstances that led to you having um, the bruise that's reflected in this photograph? There, again, there was another confrontation, another, another confrontation, another argument about something or other, and we were uh, we, we were in we were in, in um, penthouse five area, which was where uh, Ms. Hurd had her office at the top of the stairs, and so the, the stairs came down, and then there was a, a landing, and then another set of stairs went down the opposite direction, uh, and. Uh, this took place on the landing um, where she was uh, coming out, you know, trying to, uh, well, trying to get to me, trying to hit me, trying to do anything she could. And, um, and then Whitney, her sister, was there who, <clears throat> who stepped in the way. And, uh, Interesting thing that was was that inter was interesting was uh, now is that Whitney stepped in front of Amber and was facing Amber to stop Amber and uh, and uh, when she was in between us Amber snuck in the she reached got the roundhouse in and and. Uh, nailed me on the on the cheekbone do you call recall what miss heard was upset about at this time I do not I really don't and was anyone else in the uh, pen in penthouse five with you and Whitney and miss heard um, by that time mr. McGivern had been Called, I believe that um, um, actually Debbie, as I remember, Debbie Lloyd was at the front door of Penthouse Five, standing by the door. Mr. McGivern was kind of at the bottom of the last uh, group of stairs, 
and uh, and then the thump happened, and um, I got myself out of there, out of the situation, and I walked down the stairs to Mr. McGivern just to say, "Let's let's get out of here," you know. Um, and I. I remember that something was thrown from up there. I don't recall what it was, but something was uh, thrown at me. It, was, it seemed like it was like a, I don't know if it was a, a, a bag of like pens or, or, or but it was, it was from her office area. <clears throat> If we could please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 343. And for the record, this is an audio recording. We, it's um, quite lengthy, so we intend to play certain portions of it. Okay. Any objection? No objection other than we'd just like to know what minute, second portion they're going to play. Okay, but the entire audio is... In evidence, correct? Yes, no. Yes, objection? Yeah. Okay. No. All right. And 343 in evidence. If you'd like me to read the specific minutes now, or we can provide it to counsel afterwards. Hey, if you want it now, or as you go. Or, okay. Thank you. Uh, we intend to play minute 25, 37 seconds through 26, 28. Um, one hour and 57 minutes, 21 seconds through one hour, 58 minutes, 54 seconds. Uh, two hours, 38 minutes, 52 seconds through, excuse me, two hours, 38, 52 seconds through two hours, 39 uh, minutes, 43 seconds. And then two hours, 46 minutes, one second through two hours, 47 minutes, 20 seconds. Those are four clips. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to publish that to the jury? It doesn't matter. It's just audio. It doesn't matter. something to you but it was okay that's that's the promise you gave me a little while ago I'm I'm telling you if you if you lost memory last night of kicking me out the door with the fucker hitting me again and you sorry. and your memory is gone from uh, you kicking the the bathroom door and, and hitting me in the skull as I was bent down. I am Wait! Sorry. If you have those memory uh, 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 fucking, you know, di divots. I was upset. There was a lot wait, going on okay, and I was in wait, on an ambient. Okay, like, why, like, why are you obsessing over the fact that I can't remember it the way you remembered it? I said I was sorry. Okay, I didn't deny I know it. That. I'm not talking about that. What I want It's, it's, it, it's not to get you mad, it's not to get, it's just to get out of a bad situation while it's happening before it gets worse. In Australia, when we had the big fight where I lost the tip of my finger, at least five bathrooms and two bedrooms I went to. Two, two. To avoid talking to me, to, to avoid escape working me the, out. That's to the escape problem. the fight. You don't escape the fight. You escape the solution. No. You escape the solution. No. You s escape figuring it out. We cannot work it out if you run away to the bathroom every time. Listen to me. Listen to me. 
a boxer can't go 12 rounds without a fucking minute break. I'm not not giving you a minute break. You do it at minute three at the beginning of an argument. No. There are rounds, man. And when it gets too fucking hairy, the ref splits them apart or whatever. But I'm, I'm, all I'm saying is you, 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 you can't have a solution if the argument just keeps mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting. I fucking go to the, into the bathroom and sit on the floor. Bam, 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 here you come. I come out. Fight, 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 crazy, escalated. I go, I split again, I go to another fucking bathroom or a bedroom or something. Knock, 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 bang, bang, bang. You kept coming to get me. A diff or that's different. Else at me. That's different. That's different. That's one does not <laughs> negate the other. That's irrelevant. It's a complete non sequitur. Just because I've thrown pots and pans does not mean that you vases. come and knock on the door. Vases. Just because there are vases does not mean that you come and knock on the door. Really? I should just let you throw. I'm not saying that. You're saying that. You're putting words in my mouth and then making no, non sequiturs. I'm giving you a situation. No, you're trying to justify how you don't or do come to the door. No, Based I'm on whether I throw positive hands, it's irrelevant. No, I'm justifying how you, 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 you seem to think that there's this cowardice in me that runs away and I don't fight for you. And you're justifying that by saying I throw pots and pans? Okay, cool. Let's no, talk about everything you do wrong. I'm not the one who... I said to Travis, I said, no, I said to you, hey, tell Travis what just happened. Oh, you told me to do it. You yeah. told me to. You said, go do that. I said, no, tell, tell him what just happened. And I lied. And that you punched me in You're the right. fucking thing. And you, you figured it all out. And you said, no, fuck it. No, I didn't. What the fuck are you talking about? And I, I watched punch you lie. You. And then I, I didn't I said, punch you, by the way. You, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, uh, no, hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You, you know, you've been a lot of fights. You've been around a long time. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, when you fucking have a close You face. didn't get punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this, but I did not punch you. I did not fucking deck you. I fucking was hitting you. I don't know what the motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. How are you? How, what am I supposed to do? Do this? I, I'm not sitting here bitching about it, am I? You are. Oh, That's the difference between me and you. You're a fucking baby. Because you start. You are such a baby. Grow the fuck up, because you Johnny. Physical fights. I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did, so I had because, to get the fuck out of there. Yes, you did. So you did the right thing, the big thing. The, you know what? You are admirable. Mr. Depp, could you please explain to the jury what they just heard on those audio recordings? Um... What, what was displayed on the audio recordings was um, very much the tone and the aggression and the attitude um, and the need for a fight from Ms. Herb. That was, I don't know if that was some need for attention, but um, 
I don't. It, that 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 was that was a sound that I had gotten very used to. The, the squabbling, the the you know the the raising of the voice to to essentially excommunicate anything that I had to say about uh, the situation. Um, but then, uh, and I, I do remember the <clears throat> that incident. I believe that, that that's from the um, when I was um, I was in the bathroom, and I, I was in fact taking a shower. And uh, th this was in penthouse three, and she came banging on the door, banging on the door, banging on the door. I didn't answer. I was in the shower. I couldn't deal with it. I didn't want to deal with any more of, uh, of that. Oh, sarcastic, demeaning, um, aggressive, violent, toxic, spew uh, and so I was taking a shower and I didn't want to answer the door she kept banging and then I finally got out of the shower and I opened the bathroom door about just that that much just so I could have a, a good hold on the door uh, in case she tried to burst in and I was right, she did. Uh, she tried, she was, bathroom doors go in. Uh, she was pushing her, all her weight on the door, trying to get in. And I was pushing back because I, I, I didn't want to let her in because I didn't, obviously didn't want the confrontation. She was not in the best of moods, you can, you can hear. Uh, so when I was pushing the bathroom door, trying to close it, and was almost closed, she suddenly kind of yelped in, in pain. And she, she screamed out, ow, my toes or my foot or something. And so in that second, I thought, possibly her, her her foot had gotten caught under the door, which would, of course, not feel great on the foot or the toes, so I thought she was maybe injured. So I, I knelt down to have a look. The, the door was still, it was, it was still pretty well about that much open. And when I knelt down uh, on my hands and knees to look at her foot, Foot to see the injury, um, she kicked uh, the bathroom door uh, into my head. It, so it, it, um, yeah, she kicked the bathroom door into my head, and uh, I was I was completely taken aback by such a, 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 a corrosive, horrific move. So I stood up and I believe I, I stood up and I, at the, but, but this, at this point the door was open. I stood up and I said, I think I said, I think I said, what the fuck was that? What the fuck was that? And, um, the next move was just a bang. It just uh, she clocked me in the jaw, and uh, that was another shocker. How so long she, after that did you start recording? Sorry. How long after that did you start recording that audio recording that we just heard? That 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 audio recording was about her. 
trying to make less of what had happened. In fact, trying to make less of what had happened by repeating some story to me that didn't make any sense. And it certainly didn't make any sense since I was there and I was the target. Um, so I wanted some confirmation from someone with some semblance of a, uh, a mind that could understand what was happening. Uh, I wanted Mr. McGivern to come up and I asked her to tell him what had just happened. And her answer was essentially, I don't know what he's talking about. Nothing happened. He's fine. And um, once again, uh, I told Mr. McGivern, time to uh, leave the premises. <clears throat> Mr. Dubb, I'd like to show you now what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 162. Okay. Take those down. Thank you. Um, could you pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 92, please? Mr. Depp, what is this a picture of? Uh, that's that is a <clears throat> that's a photograph of uh, the blade of a of an old like, like a Bowie knife. Um, that's the photograph of the blade with an inscription on it to me from Ms. Hurd, who at the time I referred to as uh, Slim. Um, Your Honor, we'd like to move um, exhibit um, 90, plaintiff's exhibit 92 into evidence. Moved. No objection. Mr. Dubb, what does it say on this knife? Hasta la muerte. And what does that mean? Until death. And then what does it say after that? XX Slim. And who is Slim? Ms. Hurd. When did Ms. Hurd give you this knife? I, well, it was a present from Ms. Hurd. I, I believe it was sort of around 2015. Could we please take this down and pull up the plaintiff's exhibit 93? 93? 93, yes. Mr. Depp, what is this a photograph of? That's the um, knife in full view. That's the full um, side of that knife. Uh, we, plaintiffs would move plaintiffs exhibit 93 into evidence as well. Objection. All right, 93 in evidence, you can publish the jury. Mr. Depp, do you recall the occasion on which Ms. Hurd gave you this knife? Uh, I, I, d I don't recall exactly the occasion, whether it was uh, m my birthday of 2015 or if it was a Christmas gift. Um, we can take this down, please. Thank you. Um, Mr. Depp, I'd now like to show you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 65. And I believe this has already been offered into evidence. Yes. If so, if we could please publish to the jury. Thank you. 
Mr. Depp, what's reflected in these photographs? Um, there were some scratches. Um, I, uh, another altercation, and there were some misherded uh, come at me with uh, her nails or hand scratch scratching at me. And who took these photographs of you? Once again, I believe this was Mr. Pett, Sean Pett. And when were these photographs taken? Uh, uh, seems to be Christmas, or ten, 10 days before Christmas, the 15th of uh, December, 2015. Mr. Depp, do you remember what led to um, you having these scratches on your face? This was, um, yet again, another confrontation where um, as was my regular practice, there had been a, an altercation. She, she, she was, um, <clears throat> she had some rage issue with me. And um, I remember that I was trying to go to my corner as it were, which is I went, I was going into my office in, in the, in penthouse three, which is upstairs. And as I was approaching the door to my office, um, Miss Heard ran out of the master bedroom or, or bedroom and uh, started uh, just throwing wild punches at, uh, at at me, at the back of my head, at the side of my head, at my anything that she could connect with, and um, I had to. Uh, I I would have to show you uh, sort of the, how I tried to avoid the uh, attack. If, do. It's, if it's all right, yes, yes, sir. If it. it, it if I'm walking this way to the door of my office, to the bedroom door is where you are. I, I walked across the, the mezzanine there, and, and um, as I'm approaching the door, suddenly I'm just getting cl clobbered from behind, and, and one's natural primal instinct is to, is to kind of duck and cover, so I ducked and covered, but they didn't stop. So I I came up this, this like this, um, sort of protecting my face, but at the same time, with their arms swinging wildly, I, uh, I put my arms out and I, and I was able to get her into a, uh, like a, what do you, bear huggers just to to stop her from hitting me anymore um, and while holding her in that position uh, she was still trying to you know she had her legs she had her she could kick she could you know she could knee me she could, uh, so she, she was still, um, jump, you know, kind of very angry, very animated. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, it was unpleasant. What, ha what happened at the end of that situation? Because of the grabbing of the arms and, and, and holding them to her side so that I didn't receive any more blows. 
um, and and she was still fighting. I believe there was some kind of contact with our or heads or foreheads, as would happen if you're trying to uh, calm someone like that. Um, and then that was when she uh, accused me of he headbutting her, uh, of, of, of giving her a, a headbutt and uh, breaking her nose. But um, there was there was no blood. There was no. I I didn't hit her nose. I, if there was anything at all, it was a it, it was a bump of uh, well. I'm trying to restrain her. She's trying to get out of it. There's going to be some contact here and there. Accidental contact, but not a headbutt. How did you uh, escape this altercation? After she'd made the remark about the fact that I headbutted her, which which was just impossible. Um, she, she split, she, she huffed off, I, I let her go, she huffed away, and she was gone for about seven or eight minutes. And then when she came back, I was in the, I was, then I was in the bedroom of Penthouse 3, our bedroom. And she came back about seven or eight minutes later, and she had a Kleenex or a tissue to her nose. And, um, and she, then she pulled it away from her nose and she showed it to me. And there was red, there was indeed like red color on the, on the tissue. But me, I know that there was no connection to her nose, no part of my body made connection to her nose or eyes or anything like that. So she said, uh, she took it away and she showed it to me. She said, way to go, Johnny, you broke my nose. You broke my nose. And I knew I hadn't, so I said, in, you go into sort of placation mode, which is, Oh my God, let me see, are you okay? What happened, let me, let me see. And she wouldn't let me see anything. And so I just tried to calm the situation as best I could. Um, all the while I was waiting for her um, to dispense with that Kleenex because I didn't trust it. And so I waited and went she dropped it into the wastebasket in her bathroom, <clears throat> or in our bathroom, and uh, left the room. Went somewhere downstairs, I think. I don't know. And then I pulled the Kleenex out of the out of the trash uh, bin, and I inspected it pretty closely, and realized that it was nail polish, it was nail varnish or polish. <clears throat> Mr. Depp, shortly after December 15th, 2015, where did you and Miss Heard go for the holidays? Um, we, there was, it was, uh, had been planned for a while that we would be going to the island, and we would be going to the island with my, um, my kids, um, Lily Rose and Jack, and Lily Rose's boyfriend at the time. Uh, and and um, uh, there, there were uh, there's a friend of Amber's called uh, Alice Temperley, I believe her name was, is, and her boyfriend Greg Williams, who's a, uh, a very well-known photographer and a, a 
both very nice people and their kids were going to, she, she told me they were going to be coming to, to the island, and I thought, okay, great. Um, and so, yeah, that's, 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 so that's where we went for the holidays. And what happened on the island in December 2015? Yeah, it many things, but, um, was there any violence by Miss Heard against you? Oh, yes. There were. There, there was. Uh, there were a couple of incidents that were, again, just each time the, one of these incidents would occur, it it seemed to get worse and worse. That is to say, as opposed to fists or anything like that, um, I'd set up on the, on the back porch of the house, I'd set up an area um, with a, an easel and oil paints and a, a can of mineral spirits, linseed oil, brushes, everything so she wanted to paint. So I had set it up for uh, and, and for some, and again, I remember I was sitting at the table where most of the uh, paint brushes and the can and all that stuff was, and uh, the argument again escalated, 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 and she simply reached down and grabbed a can of the can of mineral spirits and. Uh, and uh, chucked it at my face. She threw it at my face, and it it, uh, it 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 struck me right at the bridge of the nose, sort of the forehead, bridge of the nose area. And uh, it hurt. Who else was around when this happened? Well, thankfully, my children and uh, Lily Rose's boyfriend were over towards the cafe. Um, I, I, at that point, I didn't know uh, that anyone else had uh, was around or had witnessed anything. Uh, I thought it was just Amber and I, but apparently um, the, 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 there are four staff who, who work on the island. I don't think it's your say. I don't think it's your statements yet. You can go ahead and continue your answer, sir. Okay. Um, um, Sorry, this the staff that work on your island, Mr. Depp. Yeah. So there are indeed four staff who work on on the island and live there uh, all year round. Um, who take care of everything, and uh, two of them happened to be in that area and witnessed the uh, uh, violence. How, how sustained as to, unless you can lay a foundation, how he would know Certainly. that if it was not hearsay. Mr. Depp, how do you know that these staff members witnessed part of this altercation? These people, as I said, they, 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 there's their staff on the island, though I consider them family and very dear to me. And uh, I, I believe it's, it is mutual. I've known them a very long time. Um, they were visibly, um, they were visibly shaken by what they'd witnessed. Objection. Again, if you can lay a foundation, if he saw them there, or if this is something Mr. Depp, did you see any of these individuals shortly after you had this altercation with Ms. Heard? No, that's not the, that's not the proper. Were they, did he see them at actually there? If he didn't, if it's something they told him, then it's hearsay. Mr. Depp, did you see any of your staff members at the house when you and Ms. Heard had that altercation? Once Ms. Heard had stormed off, um, I sort of sat there dazed and confused for uh, 
few minutes, and then I walked around the house, and I saw Tara and... That's fine. All right, I'll sustain the objection and move on. You mentioned Tara. Who's Tara? Tara's the manager of the island. Mr. Depp, I'd like to discuss April 2016 now. Um, when is when is Miss Hurd's birthday? Twenty second of April. And in two thousand sixteen, how was Miss Hurd celebrating her birthday? Um, we'd set up a a dinner for her, which was she wanted to have a dinner. Um, with her, with all her friends, and uh, Josh um, drew um, Rocky's Rocky's boyfriend, who uh, was some sort of chef. Uh, told uh, he asked her what she would like for him to cook. That's hearsay, I guess. I'm not interested to serve software for the truth of the matter asserted. He, he got it. Cool. Okay, all right, well then. I'm learning. There you go. Uh. Let me put it a different way. <laughs> Mr. Drew, who was a chef, which I don't believe is hearsay, uh, Mr. Drew had made Mexican food Ms. Hurd's favorite. Is that better? And. And what were you doing that day before Ms. Hurd's birthday celebration? Um, I had been in a room uh, for many, many hours with uh, a group of a group of accountants, uh, new accountants, and they were going through. Uh, uh, essentially, the situation that I was in financially, which was uh, um, a, a real shock to me. I, I had no idea, and I know this sounds ridiculous, but I prefer to think of the work as opposed to how much I'm getting paid. So I. I had no idea how much money I'd made. I, I, I just didn't. I just figured if I was working, it was money, so everything would be all right. Um, they informed me that uh, I had been um, well, that, uh, quite quite a, a, a an inordinate amount of sum of money had been um, was gone had uh, disappeared and uh, after having worked 30 something years in the industry um, I'm sorry I could hear Miss Brett no, you're, you're oh, fine. go ahead sorry go ahead. Uh, I was pretty shocked at, 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 at where um, I was to learn I, 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 I was Exactly, financially, and uh, it was a very long meeting, and I knew, of course, that Ms. Hurd's birthday dinner was to start at, I believe, 8.30, and uh, I texted her a number of times uh, from the meeting saying, this is, this is uh, probably going to go long. And I think I might be a little late. I'm sorry, but it's you know important, and I'm I'm I, I'm going to be a bit late for the dinner. And I apologized all over the place. And <clears throat> so when I left um, and picked up something at the house, which I believe was her gift. Um, On the way downtown, I received a text from Ms. Hurd asking me to bring um, 
asked if I could bring uh, some wine and some weed. And I texted back, sure. And then by the time I got to, uh, arrived at Penthouse 5 for the party, I was about an hour and 40 minutes late, maybe, something like that. Before you arrived, how many drinks had you had? Oh, I think I'd had a glass of wine with, there was, there was one bottle of wine that uh, Ed White had brought to the meeting that <clears throat> we, between I don't know how many, five or six of us, we had a, we, we had a glass of wine. Could you tell the jury who Ed White is? Oh yeah, sorry. Ed White was my, at the time he was my um, uh, new business manager um, and he was quite a, um, st he was quite a professional, you know, nearly forensic uh, uh, business manager and he had shown me things that, uh, that uh, from, from, from my former business managers that were quite Jack disturbing. You're saying? I believe he said he showed him. So. Uh, yes, he. Sh uh, yes, I looked at papers. Maybe they're hearsay papers. I don't know. No, I, I believe he was being shown financial documents. All right. All right. So I'll, well, I'll say no to any hearsay that might be occurred. understood. Right, next question. Um, Mr. Depp, when you arrived at the party, how did Miss Hurd greet you, if at all? Very cold. What did she say to you? Not much. Not much, except occasionally she would tear herself from the conversation that she was in just to lean towards me. I was, I was sitting to, <clears throat> to her right. And I would get a quick earful of, I can't believe you, I can't believe you've done this to me on my birthday. I can't believe I'm so embarrassed, um, you know, which I found odd because I'd kept her informed all, all, all day. And the last text that I'd received was a request for wine and marijuana. So when I got there and received that, uh, attitude, I, what could I do? Um, so I just made the best, best of it and talked to her friends and, uh, because they were all her friends except for, I believe, nurse Aaron. Aaron was there, I believe. What's Aaron's last name? Uh, Aaron Borum, nurse Aaron, who had the, been the nurse assigned to Ms. Heard. So I just, I, I just had conversations with the various people there, her makeup artist, um, Melanie Iglesias was there with her fella, and uh, I remember speaking French with them. Um, and um, I didn't really eat, <laughs> wasn't feeling it. Did you have any drinks at the once you arrived at the birthday party? Uh, uh, wine. How Gla many glasses? Uh, I don't. Maybe two. Maybe because two, two, they were like large. You know, the large sort of um, Bordeaux glasses. So yeah, maybe two two glasses of wine. By the time it started to. Uh, wind down. How many um, how many drinks did you observe Miss Heard consume after you arrived at the party? I, I really couldn't say because I I I all I saw was just there was she had she was drinking wine. Did it seem to you that she had been drinking wine prior to your arrival? Um, 
I was sure since I was an hour and 40 minutes late that Ms. Hurd was well into the wine before I got there, yes, certainly. How did the party come to an end? Uh, um, you know, this kind of, you know, one person would say, well, I better get out of here, and then two more couples or two more people would say, yeah, time to go. And then it just uh, wound down. There was uh, Mr. Drew, Miss Pennington, um, Whitney, possibly Whitney. Um, and that was about it. It was sort of left <clears throat> there. And what happened after the guests left the party? Um, she was free to uh, to commence with the uh, the usual um, verbal barrage, and I at that point there was so much in my head from the meeting. I thought it was a bit much that Miss Hurd had. I'm sorry, it, it seemed quite bratish, it seemed quite childish that Miss Hurd was holding uh, such a grudge against me for having been late to her 30th birthday party when she knew very well. She was well informed that I was in a, an intense meeting that had a lot to do with not just my life and my future, but my children's. And um, what would, I didn't know what was going to happen to, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if houses were going to start going away. I didn't, so um, <clears throat> it felt it, 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 I'm sure, of course, she felt something, but it felt unfair. It felt small, comparatively, if your loved one or your husband uh, uh, has had some very serious issues brought before him. Um, so uh, when she engaged in her normal kind of banter of uh, trying to poke at me and get me to react. I literally just got into, I got into bed. Um, I remember the television was on and I, and I was reading and I uh, suppose Ms. Heard was down in her area taking off her makeup and changing into sleep clothes, whatever. And uh, she entered the bedroom <clears throat> while I was laying on my side of the bed reading. And she was still rattling off all the wrongs I'd uh, done to her in that particular day. and and how unreliable I am and uh, what a, you know, what a horrible person I was. Um, and I, and I did not, I did not engage verbally nothing. I sat there or laid there reading my book. And when that, when she didn't get a jump out of me or a jolt out of me, she got out of bed, she walked around the bed she came to my side, and uh, again, you know, you, you've got uh, you've got a person who is uh, throwing multiple shots at your at your face, at your head, at your neck, at your at anything she could hit. So I I got up out of bed. And I grabbed her by the shoulders, and I 
sat her down on the bed. <clears throat> and I said, I'm leaving. Please don't get off the bed. Please don't follow me. Please don't try and stop me. I'm leaving. And she got up off the bed and she squared off at me in the doorway of our bedroom. And I said, what do you, what do you want to do? Hit me again? Would you like to hit me again? And I said, go ahead, hit me. Bam. And then I just said, did that, is that what you wanted? Would you like another? Bam. There's the second one. And I said, good, now you're done. Grabbed her by the shoulders, walked her to the bed, sat her down and said, don't follow me, leave me alone, I'm out, I'm gone. I went, I grabbed a few things and I got out immediately and I went to um, my other house you know, on Sweetser. As Ms. Heard was, she was leaving the following day for uh, Coachella, which is a, a, a it's a Coachella is like a, it's a big event, a concert, you know, many, many bands and um, yeah, out in the desert. She, she, she and her friends were going to Coachella for the weekend. And um, that was it, that was, that was it. Mr. Depp, after April 21st, 2016, when was the next time that you actually saw Ms. Hurd in person? I left Ms. Hurd, well, I left Penthouse 3. I left at 4.30 in the morning uh, on, it was actually April, it was actually her birthday. It was four, about 4.30 in the morning, April 22nd, and that's when I left. And from that moment on, I did not see Ms. Hurd until May 21st. And why was that? Um, I had received some news that was as absurd and grotesque and cruel. Um, and then I was shown a picture of what the problem was. I had gone to Mr. Bett and said, uh, she's, in Coachella, she's at Coachella. I think it's a good time to go downtown so that I can get some of my things, you know, and uh, get them out of there, especially the things that were uh, uh, precious to me, you know, children things, things from friends, Brando, Hunter, Thompson, whatever, things that were important to me. And he said, I don't think now's a good time to go. And I thought, it's the perfect time. She's not going to be home for two days. And then he showed me a photograph on his telephone of uh, Jackson, Your Honor. Also it's, it's a photograph, Your Honor. As being relayed to him by Mr. Beck. He he says he looked at it on his on his phone. I'll rule the objection as the photograph. What was the photograph of Mr. Depp? It was a, it was a, it was a photograph of the bed, our bed, um, and on my side of the bed, um, was human fecal matter. Um, so I understood why 
it wasn't a good time to go down there. Um, my initial response to that was, I mean, I laughed. I, I, the, it was so outside. It was so bizarre and so grotesque that I could only laugh. Um, and um, so I did not go down there that day. Mr. Depp, how was your mother's health during this time? Um, not good, not good at all. My mom, my mom was in um, Cedar Sinai Hospital, and uh, she was she was on her way out. She was dying. How she, often were you going to see her during this time? Excuse me. How often were you going to see her during this time? Um, uh, as much as I could under the circumstances. Um, but the, the, and uh, when I when I when I did go go and get to see my mom. Um, she was pretty much incapable of speech. Her speech had left her. At that time, her she she was she seemed to st she, her eyes were still open, and she was she could kind of react with her eyes, but she couldn't speak. And then, not long after that, um, once her eyes closed. She lay there for the duration of her of her life, which ended on the twentieth of May. Um, the, the, the night before I saw Miss Heard for the last time. Well, essentially. I'm so sorry, Mr. Depp. But how did your mother's death affect you? As would anyone, I suppose. There was one thing that I couldn't fathom was, I, I mean, I, I brought my kids to see Betty Sue in the hospital. And uh, at that time, she was not functioning. She was not responsive. She, I mean, she, uh, she was alive still. She was fighting still inside, but she was she was uh, lying in the bed um, and what, excuse this uh, analogy, but all I could think of was how if, if she's conscious of, of, if she's conscious of everything that's going on around her, but has no ability to speak, has no ability to move. Um, I, I knew that the one thing, as far as Betty Sue was concerned, the last thing that she would have wanted was to have ended up lying there on a, what, what it was like, there's my mom lying there on a deli platter, and it was a it was a horrible image. But I brought my kids in to say goodbye, and we all spoke into her ear, and uh, and then she passed away later. So it was, uh, 
It was painful, but there was some side of it too. At least to me, that in in in, in a way it was. Uh, I was happy for her. Why because was that? I, I can't because I can't imagine Betty Sue or my mom. I can't imagine anyone lying there in quite probably quite possibly was a, uh, a, a, a kind of a locked in syndrome. And if she's surrounded by 10 people looking at her lying there in that on that deli platter, if you will, I was happy for her that she was out of pain, out of frustration, out of I, I, I was happy that she'd moved. Not happy. I was relieved that she was no longer in that situation. Though, when those you love leave, we're the ones stuck with the uh, with the pain, with the grieving. Um, but but I was glad that my kids got to see her and give her her, 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 her send off, I suppose, and, um, but it was, no, no, it, 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 it opened my eyes quite a lot to a number of things. And what were some of those things that your mother's death opened your eyes to? That life is a bird song that that what feels like a hundred years is in fact a second, millisecond. Nobody can count those things. You know, so I had made peace with Betty Sue because I understood where she came from and I understood how difficult her childhood was and I understood that she had had not had the uh, proper training or proper teaching, or the proper background to to be anything other than what she had been when we were younger. I I forgave her for all that, um, as one would, should. So I was. Uh, It opened my eyes to the fact that, 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 that yes, if you try in relationships, whether friendships, whether courtships, whether marriage, whether this, whether that, try your best to try. If it's not going to work, it's not going to work. And. It, and, and more importantly, if you're going to get out of it, if you're going to make an end, which I had decided that I, 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 it was, somebody had to call it, and I decided that I would call Amber and tell her that my mom had, had died <clears throat> that day, and then I very calmly said, look, I've, I've made a decision and I think it's the best thing. I'm going, I'm going to file for divorce, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to cite irreconcilable differences. I'm not going to cite uh, any violence. I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to state this. We simply, the two of us, we simply don't want to feel as though we, we have a, 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 a collar around each other's neck and a leash attached to it. 
and then this piece of paper that proves that that's true. So what, what I thought was best was we want to end this in love and take the idea of um, ownership, ownership of one another out of the picture. And, and that's how I approached Miss Heard um, with that. And uh, so, so why did you go over to the penthouses on May 21st, 2016? Uh, Ms. Ms. Hurd had requested uh, that I come over to, to to have a talk, to explain. She wanted to explain things, and and uh, so I went there. But I, and I also had to wanted to gather up some of those things, you know, precious things that you live with. Um, so, so, yeah, so I, I went over there to have a discussion, what I thought would be uh, calm understanding. I, thought, I figured she understood as well as I did that, that there was no way back. And I, I also felt that she would understand that um, it was the best thing for both of us and there were no uh, there was nothing to there, there should have been nothing to fight over it was clear i told her that i would take care of her and uh, all that and um and then she <clears throat> she started to she was telling me about the uh, she brought up the situation of the her fecal matter on the bed. And I, uh, <laughs> uh, and she just tr tried to blame it on the dogs. But why, the do didn't you, why didn't you think it could have been the dogs? The dogs were, they're teacup Yorkies. They, they weigh about four pounds each. Um, the photograph that I saw, and, and, and I, I, I mean, I lived with those dogs for many years. Um, and so did Hilda Vargas, um, my, she's a, She's a woman who's been with me for 30 plus years, you know, from the very beginning. And she was the one who photographed it. Um, it was clear she knew the dogs as well as I did. And that, that was not, none of that did not come from a dog. It just didn't. Mr. Depp, could we back up a little bit? Who went over to the penthouses with you on May 21st? I went to the penthouses with Jerry Judge and Sean Bett. And I had asked them on the just in case, please pay particular attention and stay as close to the door, you know, stay at the door, or if you got a split, come back quick, you know, if they went down to the security shack or whatever it was, come, don't, don't linger, get back. Because if you hear anything, if you hear uh, uh, screaming, you gotta get in there. So leave the door unlocked and, and spring in there if you hear something. Why did you want them to be able to get into the penthouse quickly if they heard anything? Um, just based on my past experiences with Ms. Erd, when, when you say something that, that she uh, either didn't agree with or swore up and down that it was a complete falsity and 
there was something wrong with me, I'm crazy, and the, you know, the escalation. If, if, if anything was going to start to escalate, I did not want to be there. So I had them waiting by the door uh, to get in there in case anything went down. So when you walked into the penthouse, what did you see? When I first walked into the penthouse, you, you, you walk in and then make a left, uh, and then you're in the kitchen area, and then beyond that was the living room. Um, uh, I saw Miss Heard uh, sitting there on the couch. Um, and I went over to talk. I went and sat down on the couch. She was sitting on, the couch was kind of a, you know, a square or a half square, you know. She was sitting on one side of the couch. I was sitting on the other. She, that's when she was trying to explain a few things about Coachella and then the fecal uh, delivery. Um, and say, saying that it was the dogs. And I, I could, I'm sorry, I could not agree with her. I'd lived with those dogs. I picked up their fun. It was not the dogs. And so what happened was I called, I said, let's call Kevin Murphy. Who's who Kevin had, Murphy? Kevin Murphy had been, he was, he was in Los Angeles. He was, he was uh, the, um, the house manager uh, over um, the places in West Hollywood, and he was also um, taking care of the, the penthouses downtown if any work needed to be done or this or that. And he, he would schedule the, the girls who would come in, the, the ladies like Hilda, to do their work. <clears throat> and uh, he'd had a conversation with Ms. Hurd. Here's say, Your Honor. Let's move beyond the All conversation right, that on. Kevin sure. Murphy had with Ms. Hurd. Um, so after you called Kevin Murphy, what happened? I asked Kevin if Amber and he had spoken about the incident. He said, yes, they had. Okay. And um, it appears that Ms. Hurd had told... Hearsay, Your Honor. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, uh, this is a, uh, apparently a statement by Ms. Hurd. Uh, that, he that he heard Kevin Murphy. That's, that's what the testimony is. All right, if you want to... Frame that, that's fine. Okay. After you hung, when did you hang up the phone with Kevin Murphy? Um, right about the time that Ms. Hurd was screaming obscenities at him and calling him a liar and that he was a scumbag. And I, I told her, I said, listen, don't, don't speak to this man that way. Do not dis disrespect this man in that way. And then Kevin Murphy just hung up. And so at that point, she was riled, of course. And I went upstairs to gather belongings. When I came back downstairs, she was on the phone with Io Tillett Wright, and they were making a a wonderful point of just how funny it was that um, I thought that some human being had actually dropped a uh, <clears throat> grumpy, pardon the term, onto the bed. And they were yakking, they were yucking it up. They were laughing about the whole thing. And, uh, It, 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 it was it was 
you know, it was a, it was a, it was a tough couple of days, and I really didn't feel like I deserved that kind of treatment. And uh, I went over, and I said, "Let me talk to her." I grabbed the phone, and I said to Io, "You can have her now. She's yours. She's all yours." Right. And then I took the phone, and I just bang like that onto the, I mean, that side of the couch was eight feet long. The other side of the couch was about six feet long. I flopped it onto the couch, and I was walking towards the uh, kitchen to uh, exit, and then Suddenly, Rocky Pennington um, ran in uh, to the penthouse and started, you know, leave her alone, Johnny, leave her alone. And I was I was by the refrigerator at this point. I was twenty feet away. Where was Miss Hurd at that time? She was still sitting on the couch. Um. And that's when the screaming, you know, the um, the screaming started with like, again, I'm 20 feet away. She's still got Io on the phone. She's got Rocky there. Stop hitting me, Johnny, she's screaming in, in her best um, freaked out upset voice, high-pitched. Stop hitting me, stop hitting me. Jerry Judge and Sean Bett entered the room. And as they entered the room, and she was quite surprised to see them, she said, that's the last time you'll ever hit me. That's the last time you'll ever do that to me. And again, I'm, I'm a good 20 feet away by the fridge. Um, and then Jerry said, boss, I think we should just leave. And then we left. That was the last time I saw Miss Heard until, um, until she asked me to break the restraining order. Uh, or not break the restraining order. I get, yeah, break the restraining order and talk to her in July later. Mr. Depp, where did you go after you left the penthouses on May 21st? I went home. To, to which home? Oh, to Sweetser. And then where did you go? Did, where did you go after you were, went home to Sweetser? Um, I was due to, um, I, 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 I had to go to, I had to catch a flight to New York um, where we were doing, uh, the, I was, this group, the Hollywood Vampires, <clears throat> We were, we were about to set out on a two or three month tour of Europe and we, we were rehearsing in New York and then we played one show in New York as a, as a warm up gig and then we were on the plane and we were, uh, we started the, the shows in, in, um, in Europe and I was on the road from then, which was May, um, through July, uh, August or something. Ms. Myers, is this a good time to take I our was, afternoon break? I was just going to okay. suggest that. Thank good. you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Let's go ahead and take our afternoon break, ladies and gentlemen. Please do not do any outside research and do not discuss the case. Thank you. Your next question, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Mr. Depp, I'd like to show you another audio recording that is Plaintiff's Exhibit 397. Um, and for the record, we intend to play the portion that is one hour, four seconds to one hour, two minutes and 50 seconds. All right. So there's no objection to 397 coming into evidence in its entirety. Okay. The audio is coming in. 397 in evidence and then you want to play that part. That's fine. Well, 
Those wishes don't come true. Those wishes don't come true. You know what I mean? That's what you mean, cool. I wish you the best. Hey, buddy, you fuck yourself. Go suck your own dick. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'll write you a check for the extra sip I took. It's not okay. Stingy old fucking piece of shit. You're the one that brought it up. Mm-mm. You did. You said don't drink my wine. That's mine. I didn't say that. Oh, you didn't? I said I didn't think you were looking Three for anymore. Three wine. Defending me pretty good in front of your Rocky and your pop and uh, your mom. You, I, I've tried so fucking hard with you. I tried so hard. That's good. You gave me some shit about my kids, just like in London that you desired. Never again. Stay away. You don't exist. You will not be getting my words. Mr. Depp, could you please describe to the jury what they just heard in that audio recording? I don't, I don't know when, I don't know when that, if there's a date on that, <clears throat> but, um, um, clearly there was uh, some uh, animosity. <laughs> And uh, another clash, and um, Miss Heard once again um, felt it necessary to uh, bring my <clears throat> bring my kids, my 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 son, into the into that argument and say that she hopes that uh, my son's stepfather can teach him how to be a man since I couldn't. Um, uh, and I believe she says something about more man and the stepfather than would be existing in my, I believe the term was left nut. How often did Miss Heard bring your children into your arguments? Too often. And at the end of your relationship, how was Miss Heard's relationship with your children? Non-existent. They, my children, My kids are far um, more intelligent than I am, and they they broke 
they they wouldn't be around Ms. Heard any they refused to be around her <clears throat> anymore. They didn't like uh, the way she uh, treated me, which was written in a, 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 a very elegant letter by my daughter, actually, to uh, <clears throat> to Miss Hurt. I don't know if that's in evidence, but I remember the uh, my daughter sent a text to Miss Hurd. Objection, Your Honor. Just hearsay. It's one thing for the witness to tell his story. It's another thing for him to tell other people's stories. All right. You can, right. Move, you can on. move on. Okay. I'm sorry. I read the, I read the email. Yeah, I understand. Next question. Um, when did you learn that Miss Hurd had filed for divorce? Well, it was... Let's see, Betty Sue was the 20th. That night I spoke to her about the divorce. 21st was the um, kicker. I believe it w was on the 23rd, and I had already left town for New York to prepare for the tour. Did Ms. Heard know that you were out of town at that time? I don't know. <clears throat> when did you learn that Ms. Heard had made domestic abuse allegations against you? Um, the 27th of May which is, in fact, my daughter's birthday. Um, I saw that she had gone to a uh, court, was, I don't know, some court, and there were paparazzi everywhere, and her and a uh, <clears throat> brown mark on her face. Um, and it was also happened to be the day that Charlie and the no, Alice in Wonderland 2, um, through the looking glass, was opening. And that's the day that she chose to uh, uh, get the, uh, go, go to the courthouse and get a TRO, a uh, temporary restraining order against me. But I was in Europe already at that point. Mr. Depp, I'd like to show you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 487. And just for the record, this is a very long document, um, and we will be showing pages 470, or excuse me, uh, 492 through 494. There's no objection to the document 487? Sure. Okay. I assume, are you entering this in evidence now, or are you just showing it? We, I can I can give them an opportunity okay, and go sure. through it with Mr. Depp if that's okay. Um, Mr. Depp, do you recognize any of these text messages that are on the screen in front of you? vague memory of, of these. And who were these communications between? Uh, it looks like myself in the, it's me, um, in the in the green, <clears throat> and Ms. Hurd's words in the blue. And do your communications reflect that Ms. Hurd understands that you're in New York? I'm, sc I'm sorry? What is the date of your text messages here on this page? Um, that's the 23rd of May, 2016. And hers are the 24th of May, 2016. 
And based off of these communications, does this refresh your recollection that Ms. Hurd knew that you were in New York on this date? Um, in her text, you know, when do you leave? Um, what was clear that I was leaving um, right away, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I wasn't already, because I wasn't in New York City. We weren't playing New York City. I, we, were, we were playing, uh, we were rehearsing in a, um, like a casino, a big casino, and that was where we did our first uh, you know, show um, to practice. You know, first show to practice for the the uh, the tour, the uh, European tour. So I don't know if I was either leaving for New York, but I don't. I think I was already there because. New York City. Uh, we weren't, uh, I don't recall that we were playing New York City. So maybe I was su suggesting going, going there. I don't know. Could we please go turn to page uh, 940, excuse me, 494? And Mr. Depp, do you see the text message um, from Ms. Hurd on May 24th, 2016 at 633? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. And do you understand what Ms. Hurd is referring to in this text message? Uh, um, is it all right if I just take a quick glance? Please do. Thank you. Thank you, that's better. Oh. I remember, yes. <clears throat> I recall this. And what do you recall about this? That it made no sense to me. It, 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 it just didn't make any sense to me, especially about, well, as long as you don't file, nobody will know. And that, it just didn't, I, Again, I'm not all that familiar with these types of things, but if, uh, I mean, if it's two people in a relationship and the relationship is ending um, in any case, the outcome is divorce. So I, I, I didn't understand these explanations of this can happen or it cannot happen or and I only did this because my lawyers said to and um, it, it just didn't make any sense to me and and uh, it looked like uh, <clears throat> she was kind of grabbing at straws trying to figure out what in fact to do Mr. Depp I'd like to just ask you about a couple statements Ms. Heard makes in this text message she first says, just confirm that the cover letter is completely private and has nothing to do with any public record. Do you see that? The first sentence in the text message? Yes, I do. Do you know what cover letter Ms. Hurd is referring to? No, I don't. Okay. And then she says, and only included the domestic violence slash restraining order stuff because I called the lawyer when the cops were here and I didn't know what to do or why that happened and was scared. Do you see that? Yes. Do you know what Ms. Hurd is referring to when she said that? No. 
And then dropping down to the bottom, it says two lines up, I thought you filed. Do you see that? Yes. And do you have any understanding as to why Ms. Hurd thought you had already filed? No. I had, I had on the, the night of the 20th, uh, was, was when I told her on the phone that I was going to file. Um, for divorce, and in the way that I had explained it, to keep everything nice and calm, and even, um, but on the twenty third, chief filed, and um, so I, I, I had, I, I hadn't had a chance to file. Um, Your Honor, I would move um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 487, specifically the portions from page 492 to 494 into evidence. So you just want page 492 to 494? Yes, Your Honor, it's a it's a 700-page document, so I... Just page 4... Well, are you going to ever put more 487 in, I guess is the question. I believe so, Your Honor. So this is 487A? Certainly, that would make sense. Okay, so 487A... Page 492 to 494. Any objection to those two pages? No, Your Honor. All right, those two pages are in evidence. Just for clarity, that's three, two, two pages or three pages? Four ninety two. That would be three pages, if that's no, correct. That's correct. Okay, 492 to 494. Okay. And could that please be published to the jury? Oh. Mr. Depp, Ms. Hurd did end up seeking a temporary restraining order against you, correct? Yes, she did. And and what did, I believe you already said this, but could you just remind the jury, what date was that? The 27th of May. And where were you when you learned that Ms. Hurd had um, actually filed a temporary restraining order against you? I don't. I don't recall if we had left for Europe as yet. Um, that is the Hollywood vampires for the tour. So I was either um, in New York State rehearsing and uh, preparing to go to Europe, or I was already in Europe. I'd have to check the <clears throat> the, the tour dates. Did you find out on the twenty seventh, or a time uh, shortly thereafter? No, I found out on the 27th. It was everywhere. And what do you mean when you say it was everywhere? It was, um, it was multiplying and multiplying and multiplying throughout media, throughout um, social media, throughout um, so-called sort of straight media or whatever, um, and uh, I was taken aback a bit. Um, if we could take this down and please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 411. Mr. Depp, is this some of the media coverage that you were referring to? Many things of this uh, of this nature, yes. Many. And do you recall actually seeing this specific article? I, I don't remember seeing this specific article. Um, but there were already plenty, um, uh, and certainly more than I was 
happy to go through. I, I think w w once you read one or two of them, um, the general idea is, is uh, I mean, the, the point had been made um, clearly. Your Honor, I'd move um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 411 into evidence. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right, 411 in evidence. Um, could we please take this down and pull up uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 414? Mr. Depp? Yes? Do you recognize this article at all? Um, I, I, I remember Yeah, I don't know if it was this one in particular, but I do remember seeing all the various uh, reasons behind the, uh, or re her reasons behind um, her uh, needing to, to get a temporary restraining order, uh, a TRO against me, um, which they just started to uh, um, metastasize into these. Uh, there were the abuse allegations, and then there was al alcohol, and then there was drugs and violence, and it just uh, it was uh, already <clears throat> right then and there before my eyes spinning out of control. Uh, and there was not a word that I could uh, say. Your Honor, I would move Plaintiff's Exhibit 414 into evidence. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right, 414 then. And if we could take this down now, please, and put up Plaintiff's Exhibit 409. And Your Honor, um, if I could move Plaintiff's Exhibit 409 into evidence as well. Any objection with 409? No objection. All right, 409 in evidence. Thank you. Mr. Depp, do you recall seeing this People magazine article? Yes, I do. And when did you see it? Right when it was released right when it came out. Did you speak to anyone about this article? Yes, I did. Who did you speak to? Mostly friends and my sister Christy mostly friends um, and certainly the, the, the band um, uh, and my and my kids I had to uh, alert them that <laughs> there might be some ugly ugly, ugly things coming out um, <clears throat> that, that were most assuredly going to put me in the position of um, uh, some violent, drug-addled, alcoholic, uh, uh, you know, um, 
It's just reprobate. And I wanted to warn them before uh, they were approached with the People magazine cover in school from by other kids, you know. I, I, I wanted to be able to tell, explain to them that this was going to be visible uh, and it's going to be everywhere and uh, I apologize to them that this was happening. <clears throat> Had you ever been accused of physically abusing a woman before this point? No. No. How would you describe the impact of these allegations at the time they were made? And Arnold, if you could please take this down. I, I've, I've, I've felt ill. I felt sick. I mean, I sick in a sense that but I there was no tr truth in it there was no truth in it whatsoever and the fact that it was coming down on me so hard um, and so quickly and how it it, it gained momentum around the world. Um, and then you notice people looking at you differently. And then you notice calls start coming from agents and producers and um, that sort of thing. This was, this was a, this was a, bef this was before, in fact, the Me Too movement had, uh, had uh, come around. This was a while before that, so I, I, I couldn't have expected the Me Too movement to happen, but um, once that happened, then it, it just went into skyrocket mode. So you're, you're showered with, uh, uh, with, you know, you're, you're running between drops of lava. You're trying to run between raindrops that are, that, that, that kill you um, and destroy you. So uh, I was very confused. I was I was very hurt because, um, as I said before, when you when you're in a relationship and you you do give your your truth to to intimate truths to to that person that you're with. And then they start to use all that information and, like, and, and stretch it out into something that is completely shocking because, it, as I said, it, it, it just didn't, it just didn't happen. And so I felt like it was incredibly cruel and treachery. I felt it was treachery. It was, it, it, it was, uh, I don't know if she wanted to, me to just be erased or drop dead or, or, or just uh, let me stick around and allow her to ruin my life for a while and um and 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 uh and uh go out of her way to shame me and um hurt my kids and hurt people who I've known for many many years 
Um, no, it was, uh, I mean, to say that it was unfair is, 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 is about the largest understatement that I, <clears throat> I mean, it's actually the smallest understatement. I mean, the, the, it, 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 it controlled my every waking second from the moment that I woke up until the moment that I dropped even on the road playing shows you'd go out and you'd play for an hour and a half or two hours and you'd do your best to get through that and I, I can remember getting off of the uh, finishing the show getting on the bus with the other band members and just going to the back of the bus and uh, Just, 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 you know, you had to get it out. So I just sat back and in the back of the bus and uh, cried and hid it from people. Mr. Jeff, did you ever have, did you ever discuss Ms. Hurd's domestic abuse allegations with any um, producers or directors in the, in the movie industry? Um, only if they fell into the category of uh, friends. For example, Tim uh, Tim Burton, who was uh, one of my dearest friends, and uh, we've known him since we made Edward Scissorhands together in 1990. We've been <clears throat> we're very, very, very close friends ever since then. Um, um, yeah, just. Friends, you know, uh, I, I, and and then of course, as we were on the road, uh, you know, the, the the fellas in the band, you know, Alice, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Alice Cooper, is the singer of the Vampires, who's a dear friend, and um, Joe Perry from Aerosmith is in the band, and he's also a dear friend. And then the, um, a couple of the other members are just, are just yeah, very close friends. And uh, I was uh, bereft of any, I, I, you just don't know what to say anymore. You just know what to, so I, I, I Tried not to talk about it very much at all, but <clears throat> just to friends. Mr. Depp, when did you and Miss Heard divorce? When was the divorce final? Yes. The divorce was final January 2017 on Friday the 13th. And how were how were your divorce proceedings resolved ultimately? My team of uh, lawyers, which included uh, two of my entertainment lawyers, uh, my divorce attorney, um, and two and two more attorneys that were on uh, Blair Burke and uh, someone else. Uh, they, they, I wanted to, I wanted to, for lack of a better word, I wanted to fight it. I wanted to fight it because it was, there, because there wasn't an ounce, not a grain, not a molecule of truth to it. So I wanted to fight it. They... He was speaking about what he wanted to do in the context of the divorce. I understand. I, I think the next one was going to be, they said, I don't know if it's something or that. So. Okay. You can do your next question. Sure. Certainly. Um, did you pay Ms. Hurd any money in connection with your divorce? Yes. And how much was that? Um, her settlement, she wanted uh, seven 
million dollars. I believe that was the settlement, wasn't it? Uh, 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 yes, seven million dollars. And was there a joint statement that you and Miss Heard released? Yes, that's where I was getting um, the advice that I was given was to not to fight. Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. All right. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Um, who wrote the joint statement? I have no idea. Lawyers. Did you approve the joint statement before it was issued? I'll put it this way. I, I wasn't given much of a choice. Could we please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 408? And Mr. Depp, do you see um, the second paragraph from the bottom of this page? Is that the joint statement that you and Ms. Heard released together? That's the joint statement that was released, yes. And could you please read that joint statement for the jury? Our relationship was intensely passionate and at times volatile, but always bound by love. Neither party has made false accusations for financial gain. There was never any intent of physical or emotional harm. Amber wishes the best for Johnny in the future. Amber will be donating financial proceeds from the divorce to a charity. What happened after this joint statement was issued, Mr. Depp? What happened after that? Um, I, 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 I suppose, suppose, you know, the next move was to start making um, payments to Ms. Heard. Um, there were scheduled payments. Um, and then at a certain point, um, Ms. Heard had, uh, Ms. Heard had made statements to the press saying that the seven million was going to be, was the seven million was the settlement and that seven million was going to be split up between two, sh two charities. One was the ACLU and the other was the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, which in, 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 in fact was a, a, um, a breach of the agreement. Neither one of us were supposed to speak about details, money, anything of that nature. So when Ms. Heard breached that agreement, that was when I asked Ed White, my business manager, to send the first payments directly to the charities in Ms. Heard's name. Um, and after I did that, um, Ms. Ms. Heard, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Heard was very, very angry that I had made those first payments. And she went into a kind of a tirade about how I should be charged double the seven. I should be charged 14 million so that, uh, because she thought that I was looking for a, <clears throat> a tax break. Mr. Depp, between the time that the joint statement was released and the time that the op-ed came out, how many movies did you work on in that time period? If you can recall. Uh, 
when did the joint statement come out? Was it, uh, I'm sorry. Could we scroll up, please? I'll withdraw the question for the moment. In the time leading from the divorce through the, um, excuse me, in the time period between when your divorce was finalized and the release of the op-ed in December 2018, do you have an estimate as to how many television or movie projects you worked on? I... I don't exactly. I don't exactly. Um, I believe there was another, maybe a smaller tour with, with the vampires. Um, and I, I can't, it's, it's, I don't remember, it's hard to remember. I've done too many movies. That's okay. Sorry. Uh, Your Honor, I apologize. Can we please move into evidence exhibit 408? Oh, any objection to 408? We can redact that in okay. and put so it in So we have redacted 408 with just the statement then? Is that what you're talking about? Just that second last Okay. Paragraph. All right. That statement will be in evidence once we get it redacted. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If we could please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. Mr. Depp, do you recognize this document? Excuse me, yes, I do. And what is it? Um, this is Ms. Hurd's uh, op-ed for the Washington Post that I believe came out in, uh, December of 18. I, I recognize, yes, I certainly remember this. And have you actually read this op-ed? Yes, I have. And what do you think of it, its contents? Well, it was a hell of a start, I'd say, in terms of the, um, the title. If you could, if you could can, can we scroll down a, a little bit, uh, just for a second? Um, because, because I'd like to make a, a point, going, reading it and reading the words that uh, she had uh, written um, about what was obviously um, it was obviously referring to our relationship it was obviously referring to me two years ago uh, you know uh, it, it all matched up and so it was clearly about me um, and then I read the rest of the article where she talks about if you could go down uh, scroll down just a little bit After the Imagine a Powerful Man is a Ship. Um, because she goes into, she, she, she talks about, in, 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 in this section of the piece, she talks about the plight of, of, of women, uh, not just in Hollywood, but in, in, in general in the world. And there were, There were many things that I did not disagree with in terms of this 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 part of the article. Um, I, I I understand um, anyone's passion 
to right the wrongs um, that have that have been done for countless years against any any being who's suffered uh, uh, at the hands of domestic violence, be it um, women, men, children. Um, that's that's something, of course, coming from my background, that I I I, I am very very against any bullying of any human being, any forced violence, any 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 injustice committed against any human being um, so all this part of the article was strangely i mean I, it, it was it, i understood it very well and i um, i i can applaud some of this i can i can absolutely say that i believe that it was it was very well um, done with regard to violence against women or violence against anyone. Um, it, it, it just it just seemed kind of a, a strange other side, uh, like a you know like a two headed coin. Mr. Depp, um, did you experience any consequences after the release of the op-ed? Absolutely. And what yes. were those? Oh, I, well, I believe it was, uh, I don't think it took Disney very long, maybe a couple of days to, uh, announced that uh, that uh, that I had been uh, um, removed from the Pirates of the Caribbean um, films franchise um, which I learned about reading in a, in reading one of these type of well, some magazine uh, the article where Sean Bailey was quoted, which was very odd to me as I have had many creative conversations with the Disney people, um, even to the point of where they were asking me to come uh, back and write pirates. No. Sorry. We can move you, on. You want to, yeah, if you want to, just restructure. So, uh, uh, oh, I see. But, so I can read it out of someone's article, but not from the man's mouth. Is that what happens? Next question. Uh, Mr. Depp, what do you, what to, what to your understanding is the status of Pirates Six? At, at this point. Yes. Um, I believe it's in dangle mode. Mr. Depp, have you ever physically assaulted Miss Heard? Never. Have you ever sexually assaulted Miss Heard? Never. Certainly not. What have you lost as a result of Miss Heard making these allegations against you? Nothing less than everything. Nothing less than everything, because when the allegations were made, when the allegations were um, rapidly cir circling the globe, um, telling people that I was uh, A 
a, a drunken, cocaine-fueled menace um, who beat women suddenly in my 50s. Um, it's over. You, you know, you're, you're done. So um, what did it do to me? What effect did it have on me? I'll put it to you this way. No matter the outcome of this trial, the second the allegations were made against me, the accusations, the second that more and more of these things, as I said, metastasized and turned into fodder for the media, um, once that happens, uh, or once that happened, I lost then. That is to say, I lost because th th that is not a thing that anyone is going to just put on your back for a short period of time. I will live with that for the rest of my life because of the allegations and because it was such a high profile case. So I lost then, no matter the outcome of this trial. I'll carry that for the rest of my days. And uh, it never had to be that way. It never had to happen. And I don't quite understand why it did in the way that it did. I have no further questions, Your Honor. All right.